The regular meeting of the Medford School Committee will now come to order. The secretary will call the roll. Present, seven present, none absent. All please rise and salute our flag. Also present is our student Justin Welcome, Justin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're very proud to have with us tonight members of the Metro Public Schools Fine Arts Department, the Holiday Music Presentation. Take it away, Maestro. Right. So, Mr. Zigney, before you and the students go, first I want to tell you how much I was looking forward to hearing you tonight. 
So it's made our night. Thank you so very much. I will also tell you it made our night when we went to the um, orchestra concert at the high school. I don't think you could get another student on that stage. It was unbelievable. As well, myself and some of my colleagues, including the mayor and Kathy Kretz, we were able to go to the middle school concert as well. And it's just, I felt so proud. And it's so proud of our students here. You represent us so well. And it's so magnificent that we have this interest in our music program. And it's just wonderful. So thank you very much. Now, Mr. Zigney, though, I actually happen to have something I have to give you. So if you wouldn't mind coming forward. I, this is kind of funny, but I just happen to be given a donation of drumsticks. And uh, from someone who was formally connected uh, and, and did a student internship at Medford High, and he remembers us so fondly. So here's some drumsticks for you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Zigney and all members. Uh, you're fabulous. We love listening to you, and we're very, very proud of the rich musical tradition we have in our great city. So thank you and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Cuno. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to all of you. I know that you're only representing uh, the larger group of all the students that are participating in the orchestra, but not only to the orchestra, but to everyone itself, the marching band, the orchestra, the drama club. Um, you guys represent us, and you've done a terrific and wonderful job. Um, the other thing I also want to ask Mr. Zigney, and I know I've mentioned it on record here, is that we did get a donation from Mr. John Costas for the lights. Yes. And uh, if we could recognize him, well, if you guys could recognize him come the new year, uh, that would be really nice because we do have a lot of people in the city, as Ms. Vanderclue, you know, sometimes what might, when someone else might not need something, it is very valuable to us. So um, I just want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to make a quick announcement. There's a black Ford Explorer 7MP588 with your lights on. Lights on? <laughs> so if you're here. No. It's all set. <laughs> all set? I all just right. want to put that on record. It's all set. <laughs> At this time, I would like to invite Ms. Anne Marie Cugno, Vice Chairperson of the Medford School Committee, to step forward and conduct the rest of this evening's meeting. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Agenda is the approval of the minutes of December Move 4th. Move to approve by Mr. Um, Scarry, seconded by. I, I just have a couple questions. Oh, yes, Chris, if that's okay. Um, um, I just wanted to know, in regards to the field trip policy, if the um, if the the teachers and um, all the other administrators are aware of the school policies, you know, what they need to follow before they make their field trip. Um, if, um, Ms. Nelson, could you, could you help answer that question? Um, I just had a couple of questions from a teacher and I just wasn't sure if everybody's aware, you know, to follow these policies. December 4th, um, the you. next day I sent it to the administrators informing them that it was officially approved and they were to get it out to the teachers. We worked on the forms. You have the yep. preliminary forms in front of you this evening. Uh, I did email um, our webmaster to put the form, the uh, policy rather, and the forms on the web page so that it's available to everyone. But my assumption is that the principals did inform their staff about the policy shortly after it was sent to them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I just had one more. Um, 
I just wanted to know from Superintendent Belson if there was an update on the um, ongoing investigation with the concussion that was on the soccer field on October 11, 2017. Did you hear anything from the superintendent in Beverly? Is there an update? So I emailed the superintendent in Beverly with the details that I felt were pertinent to the matter. I've given you, you know, a quick update the other day. I'm waiting to hear back from him. Okay. I did speak with him, and uh, I feel like uh, something will be forthcoming from Beverly very shortly. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Press, you all set? Yes, and I can now second, sorry, second the motion to approve. <laughs> okay, so uh, Mr. Scarry, motion, and with the second of Ms. Kretz. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? It's affirmative. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Um, approved to put the minutes on file. Approve of bills and transfers. Of Move approval. Move to approve by Mr. Second. Scarry. Seconded by Ms. Van de Kloot. All in favor? Aye. 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 Roll call. And we need a roll call on it. Amory. Oh, hold on. I Do you have a question? question? Yes. Um, I just wonder if um, either the superintendent or the chief financial officer um, could, it says um, it's still the generalization like Method High School miscellaneous charges. I, I, is there any way that we can get more information when the, those items are placed on here? It's the first item on page one of six. Those are the student activity accounts. So okay, it's, so it's those are always going to be that? Correct. Okay. Mrs. DiBenedetto, if yeah. I may. Yeah. Um, just so you know that as secretary, when I sign that, I look through every single one of them to make sure they're proper and in order, and they consistently have been. Okay, thank you. Okay, roll call. Roll call for the bills. Please. Uh, Mrs. Cunha? Yes. Mrs. De Benedetto? Yes. Ms. Mrs. Kretz? Yes. Mrs. Mastone? Yes. Mr. Scurry? Yes. Mrs. Vanderkloot? Yes. Mayor Burke? Yes. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Motion to uh, accept and approve the bill of transfers of funds. Passes. Passes. Motion to approve the payrolls. Move Motion. approval. Second. Approved by Mr. Scarry, seconded by Mr. Benedetto. I'm Ms. Secretary. Mrs. Cunio? Yes. Mrs. De Benedetto? Yes. Mrs. Kretz? Yes. Mrs. Mastone? Yes. Mr. Scurry? Yes. Mrs. Vanderkloot? Yes. yes. Mayor Burke? Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. The motion to uh, approve the payrolls and place on file have passed. Report of the secretary. Um, there is none. Uh, uh, there is one, but we'll take on under report of committees. You want to do it under report of committees? Yeah. Okay. Report of the committee, which is next. Report of the committees, committee of the whole meeting minutes for December 11, 2017. Uh, so, if you would. Um, Mrs. Cuneo, I think that tonight it would be appropriate to uh, just quickly say that we met uh, at 6.30 on December 11th. Um, all of us were present, as well as uh, Michael Ruggiero, uh, school committee elect, Paul Rousseau, school committee elect, the, the superintendent, uh, deputy superintendent, uh, director of curriculum, Bernadette Riccadelli, and community members, Jen Graham, Michelle Ciccolo, and Franco Leary. Uh, the purpose of the meeting was to establish a process for the selection of the next superintendent, uh, to identify the criteria for selection, to review application forms for candidates, and to initiate a uh, process for selection. Um, the superintendent spoke about different items, um, going over what our challenges were, would be, what its job description should be, uh, giving us some information about the MASS, that's a super, uh, Massachusetts uh, su superintendent um, organization, salary information, et cetera. Um, the outcome of this meeting was that we put, uh, the mayor appointed a subcommittee. Um, she appointed me as chair, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mastone, Mrs. Kretz, um, uh, it doesn't say here, sorry, Jenny. Jen, what's your Jenny Gray. And Michael. And Paul no, Rousseau. and Paul, Paul Rousseau. Rousseau, sorry about that. Um, and we are going to meet this Thursday. Um, December 21st at 7.15 up at the high school to uh, carry forward our charge of coming up with a um, uh, questionnaire and also uh, a uh, information document that could be given out to prospective candidates. Okay, I got uh, just a clarification if I may, 7.15 a.m. or p.m.? Oh, p.m. Thank you. You're welcome. 
we had talked about AM, so it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Madam Chair? Ma also, during this meeting, we turned out some job applications mm -hmm. and job descriptions that I asked the members of the committee to look at and review to see if they had any suggested changes. We did receive some from Kathy. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I likewise have some changes. We can circulate them around so that everyone can take a look at them and see if they concur. And then we can send, send our suggestions to the superintendent to make the amendments. Madam Secretary, Secretary. accept yes. the report, place on file. Madam okay. Secretary, Mrs. <clears throat> De Benedetto. Um, just, just on that topic, I was wondering if um, the mayor could at some point possibly give us a list of criteria for school committee members to be on the committee and how she's going to make that decision. We will all be on the committee for the internal candidate portion of it. Okay. So it will be an open session and it will be all seven of us. And then moving forward from that, only two members will be allowed to and be on. And then we have, um, I handed out a draft application for those that are interested okay, in applying to be on the search committee if we need to go that far. Okay, great, thank you. And I just, I had a question also. Yeah. I think, um, so I wanted to know, because I, I think some, some of the public community was asking me, you know, why are there only two school committee members allowed for the external search? And I couldn't quite remember the answer. And I wanted to know if there was any opportunity for, like, there to be an alternate where, like, um, two committee members could serve for five meetings and then another two committee members could serve for another five meetings so that everybody would have an exposure if we get to that level. Okay, um, if I may on that one. Yes. Uh, when we sat down with Glenn Kucher from the MASC, the executive director, there are a lot of uh, legal uh, policies that we need to abide by. And so that was one of the reasons that we can't have, we can't have more than a certain amount of school committee members on that particular committee. If we do, then we also have to discuss as a school committee if you want to waive the rights of executive session and that means that everything would have to be open meeting. And that's something that you, you as a committee have to um, sit down and discuss on that. So that would be one. And the other reason I also believe that it had come up in discussion if we wanted to alternate people, but it got to the point where it'd be very, in, we're kind of like playing very, very, you know, fine line with that law. And a lot of the things, again, um, when people are asking us questions like this, it's not because Medford wants to deal with it like this, and I'm not saying it to cover ourselves, but it's actually rules and regulations and federal government that we need to abide by laws. So that was the reason we can't do that. So, Mr. Scarry had a motion to approve. Who was seconded? Seconded. Seconded by Mayor Burke. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so the um, committee and the whole meetings are approved and placed on file. Community participation, Maureen Roney. Roney, I apologize. So I am here tonight because of my ongoing concerns about the math program and test scores at the Columbus. But Mr. Superintendent, I understand that you have an update. I do. Would you like me to uh, do that instead of speaking yourself right now? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. So this evening I passed out an update uh, based on our discussions about what might be possible in order to provide uh, additional assistance to the students at the Columbus. In your packets, you have a much more comprehensive discussion about additional measures uh, that we're doing, but apropos to uh, some suggestions made from the outside, including uh, Mrs. Renee, um, I put this memo together to give you a, cl a clarification and update of what additional things we're going to do, and if your permission, I'll read it publicly so everyone can hear it. Do you have a copy? Yes, thank you. Um, as part of our plan to assist students at the Columbus with their mathematics preparation for MCAS 2.0, please note the following. Students in grades 3, 4, and 5 who require ad extra assistance to master the mathematics curriculum will be eligible to receive additional tutoring from paid Medford Public Schools teachers. Students will receive between uh, one and two hours per week based upon their need. Now, it depends on what the student's need is and you know, what kinds of uh, recommendations their individual teachers make. We expect to hire six teachers for two hours each as tutors a week who will be paid by the Medford Public Schools from our budget. 
This program is planned for 16 weeks starting in January, and the projected cost is an additional $6,200. We project that the cost of an extra afternoon bus at the Columbus will be paid uh, approximately $150 a day uh, for a total of $4,800. We're working with our current provider, Easton Bus, to arrange a schedule. We may have to find another provider since Easton's schedule is very tight and additional busing may not be possible through them, although we had discussions with them this afternoon and we think it is possible. But since there are three buses leaving the Columbus each day with different routes, we will have to devise a route that serves the majority of students in the program. And there may be a need to create a consolidated route. Obviously, buses go in different directions. Um, in order for us to create a, a consolidated route, there may have to be some different types of stops. The overall cost of transportation, um, we believe, will be about $4,800. Um, since there are, well, I, the overall cost then is projected between tutorial and busing to be about $11,200 for the 16 weeks. There are multiple logistical issues to be worked out and there may need to be some modifications. And we'll make those adjustments based upon multiple factors. We'll keep the school committee informed as we progress with implementation. Things like which teachers volunteer to teach, which days are most appropriate, which days the buses can go and what routes and so on and so forth. So there's a number of things to be worked out in the interim, but uh, this is the basic plan and hopefully that addresses your issue. I'm going to just ask, uh, okay, so Ms. Benedetto, and then. Hi. Thank you. Um, thank you for handling this so quickly, uh, Ms. DeBelson, in such a proactive way. Um, that's what we hope to be as a committee, find out that there is an issue and be very proactive about handling it so that way it doesn't continue. So thank you for handling it so quickly. Um, I just have a few questions. Based on this math, um, $150 a day for a bus for a total of $4,800 divided by 16 weeks, that's two days a week for a bus. Is that correct? That's the way we're planning it right now. Okay. Um, also, so since we have a bus at that school and leaving, can the kids in the extracurricular programs um, take the bus as well home? So that way more kids that um, can have access to after school activities, and since we're already paying $150 for a bus, given that if there's enough room, can we, can we look at opening that up, please? That's a variable we should look at, but I don't want to make any commitments till I see exactly how many students are riding the bus for this particular program, uh, because I just don't know. It could be concentrated at a full bus. It could be that uh, we have a lot of room. So let us get into the weeds, and we'll see exactly uh, you know what's possible. And what is the criteria for the students that would be picked for this? Is it their grades? Is it their uh, MCAS scores? Is it a combination of both? Like, how, what is the criteria for a student to be? We'll sit with the teachers. Could it be parents' requests? Like we'll sit with the parent... teachers and the principal to look at which students clearly need it. If a student's doing exceptionally well, then chances are they don't want the help. If a student really needs it, uh, we hope that they will want to participate. We can't make anybody participate. There's some people that maybe don't want to participate who could use the help. Or there might be a parent that wants their child to be part participate, even though it may look like they're doing well in school, but what they see at home, the struggle at homework, is not always the same as it is in the classroom, as, as I remember it as a parent. Um, so, you know, I would like the parents to have some, some say and input, or at least be able to request it for their child well, as well. I think we've got to begin with, let's target the students that we're looking at, and then we can open it up a little bit more, but let's see exactly what kind of response we've got. And I've also got to make sure I've got six teachers that want to do it. You know, actually, feel, and I feel they can actually do that particular work. So there's a few things that variables, like I say, and the, the logistics have to be worked out. And until we actually talk to people specifically in the, in the, in the, at the school and work out some of the details as to how many students would be on which days, there may be some students who want to come one day, some who want to come two days, got to work it out. So at this time, I'd like to motion to approve this program and get that going. And I would like a follow-up report, the first, first meeting back in January, since their time is of the essence, because MCAS are coming. You know, oh. they don't slow down for anyone. So we want to make sure we get the word out to parents as quickly as we can that this program is going to be taking place and that they can have some input as well. Um, thank you so much again. And there's a motion on the floor to have this approved and Second. to have an update. If I can just suggest that, what do you call it, that the update, I can give you a, a 
briefer update through email or through some process, but it may take an extra little time to work out some of the logistics. Because remember, next week is going to be a fairly, um, well, this week rather, is going to be a fairly chopped up week with different things going on. And the logistics of getting commitments from people to do things may take a little bit of time in January. Okay. okay? And even if you only have partial update, just, just either by email or at our next okay. meeting, um, we want to be ca kept abreast of this We'll keep issue. you posted. Thank okay. you. Ms. Vandekloop? Yes, um, a couple of different things. I just wanted to uh, mention that in our uh, folders, we also received all the other things, which uh, all the other plans, um, adding 15 minutes of math instruction daily um, and Chromebook practice. So that we had a further report uh, which covered additional in-school items um, that would be uh, addressed. Um, it also, um, though, I just wanted to clarify, and Mr. Superintendent, I know uh, we're being redundant here, but um, I, I understand that you're now committed to having a, a um, after-school tutoring for the math students paid for by the district, because I'm just clarifying that, because earlier yes. there was a rumor, um, and so I want to put that to rest, and committed to uh, working out transportation, after-school transportation. It sounds like so far financially you've committed to at least two days a week is that correct that's our plan okay i know that your request would have preferred three i think two is probably a reasonable place to start so okay that's great thank you so much and i would like to thank you very much uh from the get-go uh you've been very very concerned about this um issue uh, maureen and i thank you for for coming forth and addressing us and see i told you it'd be easy uh the other thing too is though i think that um when I went and first met Maureen um, at the math night, one of the things that just stood out so um, much that night was when I had a great discussion with um, some of the teachers, and they were telling me about all the different things our math program could do, but then admitted that not every student had access to that at home. So by providing this after-school time, this gives them an opportunity to utilize those um, our math program to the full. So thank you very much, Mr. Superintendent, and thank you, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through you to the superintendent, thank you for putting this report together, Mr. Belson. It, it's very comprehensive. Uh, I, as one member, have been very vocal when it comes to MCAS tutoring, and I'm glad to see that we're reaching out to the middle schools and helping them with their math and other problems. I would ask that you report back to your committee in late April, early May on the trials and tribulations of putting this program sure. in place, and I'll see where we can do better, see what, what works, and possibly incorporate it into the other schools that need this? We can discuss it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and if I may, um, just for clarification, because I know Mr. Scott, just mentioned middle school, but it is the elementary school that we're discussing. Right. Okay, I just want to make sure of that. And um, I just want to piggyback a little bit on what Mr. Benedetto said. Uh, I think it's a great idea if we could utilize the buses when we have students that are staying after school, but with that being said, I just want to make sure that the students that are there for this particular purpose and service are being uh, addressed first in a way. I don't want to kick anybody off a bus, but if this is a program that we're going to be investing in, I want to make sure that everyone gets uh, the best possible opportunity to utilize it the best we possibly can. So with that being said, um, let's see. Are we going to roll call on? Not a roll call, I'm sorry. It was Ms. Benedetto that had put the motion in, and Mr. Skerry had second. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Uh, Madam Chair, since we're expending money, I think we should do a roll call. Roll call? call. Okay. okay. Uh, so on the motion, Mrs. Cugno? Yes. Mrs. De Benedetto? Absolutely. Mrs. Kretz? Yes. Mrs. Mastone? Yes. Mr. Scurry? Yes. Mrs. Vanderkloot? Yes. Mayor Burke? Yes. Okay, seven in the affirmative and none in the negative. We will be passing that and starting up the program as soon as we can and placed in file. So recommendations to accept the gift to the robotics club, Mr. Superintendent. I'm going to call upon uh, Carolyn Joy, who is here, our director of mathematics, uh, to come up uh, and talk about the very generous gift once again from Dr. Martinez and Short. Good evening and thank you so much. Um, 
We are now in our seventh year of the robotics at Medford High School, and the robotics team, every year they participate in what they call a bot ball competition. Uh, it's specifically designed a robotics uh, tournament for students in the um, New England region. And we're happy to uh, present to you um, Dr. Van Shore has graciously donated some funding, a gift to the Medford High School to enable the students to participate in this. Uh, Ms. Faiza Khan, who's here tonight, is the advisor for the club this year. Uh, Ms. Faiza might want to tell you a little bit more about the students and what they've done so far. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's really an honor to be representing robotics team here. We have a great set of students, and they are very diverse. Um, they, they are very enthusiastic, and they came to me and they said that Ms. Chen would like to pass the torch. Would you please take this on? And so here I am. Um, very excited to be the advisor. It's a great opportunity. Um, it's really the kids that are driving me. I, I appreciate it that they, they <coughs> came to me. Um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Van Scour, uh, Dr. Van Scour has been very generous. Um, he replied back, his secretary replied back to my email within a few hours. And so I appreciate uh, that and I'm grateful for the, for the grant on behalf of the students. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank, you. thank you. If you could just make sure that during the year you let us know how <coughs> students are doing, especially when it comes to their competitions, we'd like to see that. Absolutely, yeah. thank you. That, the, the competition will be in April. Just thank, so you. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Motion for approval. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, yes. Roll call vote, please. Yep. Mr. Uh, Scurry. I, I thought Mr. Scurry. Uh, Mr. Yes. Scurry will be speaking first. Ms. Joy and uh, your, your cohort, I'd like to thank you. It's been, uh, during my tenure on the board every year, Dr. Ventura has always come up for, to help our kids out, and no matter what competition they go to, they always do well. And I wish you well in your endeavors, and I would ask that the school committee invite Dr. Van Shore to a meeting, and uh, he can present himself to, to us and to the community for his, his great deeds, and I hope he continues for many years to come, and I wish you and your team much success in April. Thank you. Thank you. We are deeply honored. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. Vandekul, did you have a question? No. Okay, Ms. Benedetto. Through you to the superintendent, um, could we please send a letter of thank you? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, is this like the sixth year? The seventh. Seventh. seventh year? Yes. Seventh year? Okay. He's done a great job, and again, we uh, appreciate all that he's done. All of them. Yep. So I, I just want to make it clear to everyone that uh, the work that the students are doing through the department uh, is not only incredible, but I've been yep. told that at least one of the robots they're creating is going to apply as an internal candidate for my job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should have known better than to say yes. It's the holiday season. They're building the super year. Oh, we're getting too serious. Okay, so, may it uh, Motion, second by uh, Ms. Vandekloot, I believe it was. Yes. Mo uh, roll call, please. Mrs. Cunha? Yes. Mrs. De Benedetto? Yes. Mrs. Kretz? Yes. Mrs. Mastone? Yes. Mr. Scurry? Yes. Mrs. Vanderpool? Yes. Mayor Burke? Yes. Seven in the affirmative, nine in the negative. We will graciously accept the gift from Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, report on Center for Citizenship and Social Responsibility. So, this is something that's been in the works for a few years. Uh, Mr. Trotta has. Uh, continue to be involved as the director, along with Michael Scorker as the coordinator. And you have some materials in front of you. I'm going to let Mr. Trotta tell you about what's here and have some of the students and Mr. Scorker tell you a little bit more, because I think this is a terrific project and it's got tremendous implications for the development of our young people, not only as academics, but as uh, full-blown citizens in our community and in the world, where I think that's a bigger need these days. Thank you. Uh, Richard Trotter, Director of the Center for Citizenship and Social Responsibility, better known as the CCSR. Before I begin the report, though, I wanted to uh, say that um, I've had the pleasure of working with Ms. Cuneo and Mrs. Carey for many years, and both of you have been so supportive of all the programs in the schools. You truly have, you know, been um, a real positive influence on, on what I've been involved with, and so I wish you well. Um, I hope I still see you. 
after you beat the seat. And uh, so um, thank you for working to help the kids in Medford. Thank you. Um, so the, the CCR has a mission. The basic mission is to create global citizens who will combat things like racism, bigotry, gender bias, and help promote positive experience to, to other students in their own, own lives to um, help them become successful in the future. So the students who work in the CCSR, and we have some here tonight, um, they do positive things in the, in the community. But it helps the community, but it also helps them. And the whole point of the program is to make the world a better place, and you do it one student at a time. Um, we, like to, we, we are very active at the high school, and we are spreading the program down to the elementary and middle school. Um, last year, we were very low on funding, so we basically just did the high school as the only major area for the projects. Uh, this year, we have a grant from the Cummings Foundation, a $100,000 grant that we obtained, that's allowing us to expand the program and do more things in the school district to help, to help the students and the faculty. So a couple of major things are going on. One is we've awarded uh, 10 mini grants to faculty members to do projects at their schools. Um, we'll have a full report later on in the year when they've actually accomplished their work. But right now I can tell you that we have um, a project that did Thanksgiving meals for needy people uh, with a French class, so using French cuisine. Um, we have, uh, we're organizing a race, a road race to raise money for a charity with, with the, some of the students at the high school. We're purifying the Memphis High School grounds by uh, planting fruit trees around the area. Uh, so that's an environmental project. We're adding uh, composting to the cafeterias at the high school to teach the students to be environmentally friendly and to maximize the resources that the people use and not waste things. We're also helping the Brooks students, uh, helping uh, uh, renovate a play, play area for other students. So uh, one of the teachers down here is working with us on that and with the, with the school people. So uh, those are some of those mini grants. The mini grants, uh, they have to apply for them. And they have to show the project and what the outcome is going to be and you, you get them by, a comp not competitive, but you have to prove that you're doing something valuable. Uh, we also have five uh, total school leader advisors, similar to Mr. Scorker. Uh, they're just getting going now, and they're gonna be organizing multiple events at these schools and provide leadership for the school, but also the students become leaders at that school and set the role models for other students. And one of the things that students typically do, they look at other students as role models, and if they see them doing positive things, we're hoping that that will spread and more students will do positive things. So uh, right now at the high school, uh, we have a very active group. Uh, I'm not gonna go too, into that too much deeply, but it's coming up. There were 33 pro projects going on right now, and so I'll let Mr. Scorker and the students talk about those. So some of the things planning for this year with the grant, now we didn't have this funding before, so now we've got some new innovations going on. Um, we've added professional development for teachers. We're gonna be offering workshops. We're going to uh, work on SEL, social emotional learning in the classroom and also um, ways of te technologies that we can use to, to improve uh, teaching. For instance, one of the things that we feel strongly about is project-based learning. Project-based learning emphasizes student activity in the learning process. It emphasizes students being engaged and actually doing something they have an interest in. Um, we believe by doing this, they will certainly gain uh, a positive result and there'll be more, more of an impact on the learning when they're actually actively involved. So that's one of the things that we're going to do professional development on to help other teachers do that sort of thing, whether it's in uh, our area of uh, focus or on their own area of focus. But uh, clearly, project-based learning is a philosophical initiative that we believe in. Um, we also want to promote, um, provide parents with information. We're going to have some activities at night, speakers and symposium type things that will help parents gain more information about how do you deal with anxiety with students, how do you deal with uh, students who exhibit certain behaviors that might lead to um, problems with their self-esteem and their uh, resiliency and in, in to, to fight negative activities like drug abuse and that kind of thing. Um, we're also looking at new strategies in, in thinking and learning 
The mirror neuron is um, a, a relatively new concept that t students, people, uh, we identify with other people by mirror neuron in the brain. We, we feel that um, some students in the early ages who lack empathy, maybe by going through this kind of a process of identifying with other people who have problems, will help them become more empathetic. So that's kind of a, a, a goal at the elementary and middle school. So we're also going to use the uh, money that we have for resources on the web. We're going to provide web resources for teachers and parents about this social emotional area and about identifying uh, positive activities for parents to use and teachers to use in the classroom and at home to make them students more, uh, uh, more positive contributors to society. Um, and the last initiative is we want to share our mission. We, we believe that, and, uh, that this kind of a program should exist in more, pu more public schools, more areas. We spend a ton of time doing academics, MCAS and all that, uh, but it, there seems to be a need now to, to, more, to do more work in developing uh, character and positive attributes in students that will lead them to be successful and not to be uh, subject to things like addiction and prejudice. Um, I want to, before, as I finish, I want to thank the superintendent. Um, actually, we, so this mission came and vision came from a conversation we had a few times back when we got the money from Bloomberg. So the uh, superintendent is part of the brainstorm behind this thing. And he's always supported us and uh, his, his support has been very critical to our success. And also the school committee, obviously all of you have supported, supported us and, and I look forward to getting to do more with you guys and um, be back again. You thought you got rid of me? Oh, you haven't. <laughs> okay, so are there any questions before I pass it on to Michael Scorp? Before I pass it on to anybody else, I just want, I have a couple of questions, and that is, how long is this grant for? Yeah, it's three years. And this is a second? Like, First. Oh, okay, because we got it approved last year, yeah. so this is a, okay, three years. And then, just to, because it's been such a great program, and already there's been so much going on. At the end of the three years, have they already discussed like what the process is going to be, if you're going to be able to reapply for it, or is it so if we are going to be able to reapply? I or is it can. like one yes. of those you can't reapply for it for a certain amount of time? Oh, okay. Um, I thought we'd look into that one, but we're also we're not stopping with the Cummings Foundation. We're looking for other resources. You're looking for what? Other resources. Okay. We're looking for other venues and, and foundations to, continue to contribute. And I don't know if this is more of a question for you or for Mr. Scorker, but um, I know already you have so much on here. But just to throw it out, I know a lot of the time when I've gone to the senior centers, um, they ask us about our students. And some of the seniors, unfortunately, have not had the opportunity to be with our seniors, um, with our high school students, I meant to say with our high school students. So you hear, you know, certain stories. And I've heard this year, you know, well, if you're on the school committee, then why don't you try to teach those young folks <laughs> some manners or some respect? And when I hear things like that, I get very upset because they're touching my kids. And I know the type of kids that we have. So if you have the opportunity, because I tell them all the time that our kids do have respect, and they do have manners. And you'd be very surprised at what our kids do. If we have the opportunity, and if you could throw that in your schedule somehow, somewhere, I would really like to see that collaboration going on. Um, I think it would be amazing for them, just as much as it's amazing for us and our kids. I know bringing my own kids with me to certain events that I didn't think maybe, you know, the, the senior center would be happy to have kids when they were younger, or vice versa. It was amazing when I left there because they loved that interaction, and my kids actually love the interaction of hearing all these different stories. And it's nice, they're here. They're in our center of our square. They're in the center of the heart of our city. It would be nice for them to know what type of students we have. So, Mr. Benedetto. Thank you. Um, I just wanted some more logistics about the grant. Now, I know that Mr. Squawk has been, I, you've retired, so I, from, from the school district and you're still involved in this project. Um, is it your intent to stay with it for the next three years? Okay. Yes, absolutely. And, and then um, does it, does 
this project and this grant free up any teaching time from Mr. Squirker so he can focus on this, or is this after school? How, do, how does the whole thing work? He, uh, he has a mini where he has some students, which is uh, two times a cycle, a course, mini course. But most of his work is on his own time after school uh, during free periods. So if he could get freed up a class, that would be marvelous. Now, does he get paid for his time in addition to his salary for this project? Is that part of the grant funding? What's that? Is there What's a that? stipend for him? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and yourself as part of this project? Yes. Okay. I just, I just want to make sure that we're not burning out, you know, some of our finest and best within the district mm -hmm. um, by having them wear too many hats. And I didn't know if it was something that the school district was partially funding by helping him with that or um, if that's a dream in the future. I, I just, maybe the superintendent can, can enlighten me a little bit more of the logistics of all of this. So, obviously, all these programs, we seek outside funding to support them long term. Uh, originally, the funding came from Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, Cummings is the next round, it's a three year uh, grant. We'll be looking to get more money into this activity and expand it and develop it. Uh, I might tell you, I think I mentioned it once before, that Mr. Cummings, William Cummings, is going to be a special speaker at graduation this year. And uh, we'll be having other outreaches to different people at different times because obviously philanthropy is an important piece of what we do in order to keep some of these programs going and to develop them into model programs that can then uh, receive even greater sources of funding long term. So that's the game plan and uh, <coughs> obviously the great Excuse work me. I think you know uh, they'll tell you that their finalists are ready in uh, some outside programs and uh, they're already getting some great recognition. I won't spoil this at this particular thing but I was told on Saturday night that another one of our programs is going to go national so I'm excited about that but you can't find out about it tonight because I can't <laughs> tell you about it. Uh, and, uh, but these are the kinds of things we want to do, and as we do these things, you know, we attract sources of funding that are extraordinary and support our efforts to keep meaningful projects moving in addition to our regular academic and educational program. So my, my point was, um, based on the social, emotional needs of so many students that I see both at the district I work at and our district, and, and the, this book of wonderful things that have been done. I just didn't know if we had plans on expanding this program so that way it's like a more full-time position for someone from the Method Public Schools to manage because this is a lot. This is a lot of wonderful things and I would just hate for it to go away. To go we away. just need to develop it over time, you know what I mean, and, and develop other dimensions to it created in a certain way. One of the things that's happening, uh, again, something I'll tell you about that at a subsequent meeting, is the Commonwealth uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is launching what they call it celebrating Massachusetts leading the nation. And we had a meeting with representatives from the department the other day, and the purpose of it was to identify projects in our school system and some other school systems that would demonstrate how Massachusetts leads the nation beyond testing, because obviously testing is something that we brag about as a nation, I mean as a school system, not a school system, as a, as a, as a state, as a commonwealth, but there are many other dimensions to education that Massachusetts leads the nation in, and this is a good example of it. And there's some other really terrific examples, our family networks, other things like that, that you know are really unique and model programs that other people should be trying to do because they fill the gaps that many communities don't have. So this is one of them and this will also bring in resources. This right. is how you do it. So just as we increase the number of school adjustment counselors and counselors and you know different behavioralists yep. through our buildings, this is a positive way sure. to bring that forward and I think that um, as a committee, we should really look at positive ways to influence and to, uh, to enable our children to become leaders. But in order to have that, we need to have people like Mr. Trotter and like uh, Mr. Scorker to lead the way and have these programs and, and to really invest in this in our committee, and I mean in our district. Um, that's my point. 
I, I just want to make sure that, you know, we don't burn out people by trying to do everything and we just want things to done, be done well. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, okay. So thank you. I'd like to pass the baton to Mr. Squawker and the students. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Michael Skorker. Um, I'm the advisor at the high school for the Center for Citizenship and Social Responsibility. Um, I'll keep this brief. Uh, as Rich was telling you, um, right now at the high school, we have, you have the booklet in front of you, we have um, just over 35 projects happening. Um, many of them are at the high school, but a majority of them are happening um, citywide. And I'm looking at um, the mayor here. You've met with a lot of our students already. I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, I think you've met with three or four groups already, and you're meeting with another one next week, they tell me. And, um, we appreciate the collaboration. I'm thankful for all of your support. Superintendent Belson, very thankful for your support as well. Um, this is, like I said, a collaborative effort, and we couldn't do it without the support of you. So thank you so much. Um, in addition to the 35 projects or so, we have 84 members um, at the high school right now. Um, it has grown exponentially since the first year we started to include students when the student, the first year that at the high school um, with student involvement was only 18. So we went from 18 students to 84. Um, and it's growing every single day. I have students coming up to me asking to be part of it. And the club inclu is inclusive of anybody. So anybody who would like to join that is interested in doing a project to help other people, interested in being a positive contributor to society, um, we're looking for them and we never say no. Um, the point really is I'm really the guide on the side for a lot of these projects. The students approach me with something that they're passionate about, something that they've been thinking about changing or something, an idea that they had to maybe make the, the community a better place. And so I, I sit with them. Um, I've sat with all 84 of them so far. <laughs> And we come up with a strategy to make that plan happen, to set that plan in motion. Maybe it's meeting with some of you, maybe it's talking to somebody in the building, or maybe it's just really starting from the ground up and seeing when the project can go. All of these projects will happen throughout the course of the school year this year. Many of them, the majority of them, will be finished in May where we have a fair. As Rich mentioned, we have started the CCSR at four schools now. Um, we're at the Roberts, we're at the Columbus, um, the Brooks and I'm forgetting one um, and all of those schools will be um, putting on a fair at the end of the year as well to, to showcase the projects that they have that they have done. Um, the fair usually takes place in May and so we like to form we'll send out a notification when that happens to invite you. Um, I think some of you came um, last year. I remember, um, Mr. Scott, you were there. I really want to. I thank you for coming. I think you saw how um, passionate the students were and what great work they're doing. Uh, besides that, I just want to let you know today, tonight we're going to have really short presentations about some of the projects that are happening now. Some of these projects have already been, um, have already won um, acclaimed national news. Some have been on Channel 5, which you'll hear from Stella in just a second. And uh, without further ado, before I uh, announce Stella to give the first presentation from the students, um, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Mr. Scary. Through you to uh, Mr. Scorker. Hey, I'm really glad to see that uh, your uh, Orchards into the Fells will hopefully come to fruition. As a kid growing up in Medford, where the high school is now, that was once the city infirmary where indigent citizens in their later years ended up. And before they built the high school, there were pear trees, cherry trees, peach trees, four or five different kinds of apple trees. And uh, it would be really great if we could bring this back to that location. We started clean up um, this, this two weeks ago, um, just to start getting the area cleaned up. We're working with Ms. Retta Smith um, at the high school, and so our goal by the end of the school year is to have that orchard um, ready to go. So and I'm pretty sure if you contact the uh, Johnny Appleseed uh, Museum in Littleton, they might be able to help you out with some apple trees. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, so I see one of the projects is called Benches for Duggar, and I don't know if you are real, realize this, but our my <laughs> <laughs> this is scary. Here's your new job. He <laughs> builds beautiful benches and Rustic, tables. Rustic farm tables. Right. Oh. benches. Okay. Yes. So you know you may want to invite them up when there's building involved. 
and I know he recently retired from his job as state auditor, so he does have the time to come and volunteer and help <laughs> the students. You're more than glad you might. Well, I never say no to help. Anyone will mm -hmm. tell you that, so <laughs> you're hired. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> not, not that I have volunteered him, but you know me, I'll, I'll throw anybody to it. Yeah. But also, the yes, I will. It's okay. <laughs> so sorry. I was no going to say throw you under the bus, but this week I don't want to say I've, that. I've been there before. It's, it's no, nothing new. Also, what I'd like to say is I would like to see some more um, PR about this. And I know that the transcript is always at our meetings. And I'm wondering if we could highlight one of these groups on a weekly thing um, with the transcript and see, you know, where they are now in the planning stages and then every once in a while pop a different group every week it, or some way um, since they're here and you're here, I'm hoping that we can push for that to happen. Thank you for the moment. Well, I, I, I'd like to all, for all of you to join us. We have a Facebook page that um, every, it's funny, we just, it's, it's funny to say that we just finished um, publishing this book and so from this point forward on our Facebook um, page and our Instagram page and you can feel free to follow us on both um, we are posting each project um, one and once every three days so that the public is aware of the projects that are happening right now so that is great but a lot of our citizens, especially linking the seniors as um, Ms. Cuneo suggested earlier we need to imprint I agree. And Ms. Cuno, if I could mention, um, one of our projects that's happening right now is called Tech Time. Okay. And there are three students that go to the Senior mm -hmm. Center and they um, teach the, um, the senior citizens how to use technology. So for example, how to set up a Facebook, um, what is Instagram, how to send an email, um, how to upload a photo, um, and so, and how to take a selfie was a big one with them. And so they started um, in September of last year, and they, so the senior, the senior citizens have to sign up for an activity they want to do that day. And so only two signed up on the first day, and those two went back and told everyone else how awesome the session was. And so they went from two, and the next month they had 20 there. And wow. so it, they go once a month, and they're still doing it right now. I did hear about that program. Actually, yeah. I had a lady who approached me on that, and she was extremely thrilled that we were that you guys were doing it. I'm not gonna say we, you guys were doing it, and uh, they were very happy because they actually had the interaction with the young kids, and they got to learn something. Uh, I guess what I was looking to is that not everyone goes to those classes. Right. So like I know that they get you know together on a Friday at lunchtime, especially around the holiday times and around the year they have like certain lunches that they do and I know it's hard because our kids are in school but if there's ever that opportunity uh, to go there just to you know introduce themselves you know tell them what you're there for and maybe you know solicit more people for the programs that you're doing. Sure. Um, something like that. That was that was what I was looking at. It's a great I did hear about that and uh, it's a fabulous program. Thank you so much. It's a really great idea. That's it? Okay. So now I'd like to introduce the students. Yes, I would like to call up um, Stella Eliopoulos. She's going to talk about her project from the CCSR. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Stella. Um, some of you know me. Um, I'm a senior. Uh, I've been a part of CCSR um, since I've been a senior. Um, one of my regrets of high school is not knowing about it earlier, not joining it earlier. Um, I didn't, I wasn't fortunate enough to have Mr. Skorker as a teacher, so I didn't hear about it until um, spring of last year from one of his students. Um, immediately though, I went and I talked to him. I was like, I'm interested, I wanna join. Um, and so he kind of got me in for this, for this fall. And it's been a really great way for students that want to be active and don't necessarily have the means to be active and do these projects that they want to do, um, this is a way for them to kind of, it's a vessel for them to initiate those projects and make a change that they've been hoping to see or that they, they, they um, want to move forward with. And for me, the project that I did, um, it was actually out of state, it was in, um, Houston, Texas. I don't know how much you all know about it, but so over the summer I was at this program in New York um, through the New York Times and I met this girl from Houston and we stayed connected when we got back and right around the time the hurricane hit was when her school started and um, Hurricane Harvey and so 
she said a little bit here and there about how it was affecting her. And of course, we heard it on the media, um, saw pictures and stuff like that. But it was different for me this time hearing this, this personal firsthand account um, from someone that I knew how she was experiencing it. She, uh, a lot of school was canceled for her. A lot of her friends' houses got damaged. Um, and so I kind of felt that tug of compassion that I hadn't before with something like this. And I, I wanted to do something. And now that I was part of CCSR, I had been searching for an idea for my project at the same time. So I thought that connecting the two would um, be able to do what I wanted to do and with this help for Houston. And so I, um, with the help of Mr. Scorker and Mr. Trotta and CCSR, I um, planned a donation drive back, back in September, I think late September, and school-wide, so I had students, I encouraged students to bring in donations like toiletries, um, non-perishable items, clothes, um, different things like that. And at first I was a little worried about, you know, students not really being um, active about the fundraising because I know that that's been kind of a problem in the past, whether uh, fundraisers aren't very, like, widely known around the school, but I was very pleasantly surprised at the amount of goods that we got, and it was actually so many goods that we didn't have um, the funds to ship them all down because it was too expensive. Um, so here I got kind of stuck for a little while, and I was trying to figure out how to get them down there. Um, and, you know, we reached out to different organizations to see if we could get any help, and the Red Cross, you know, once the Red Cross was like, we, we can't really help you out in shipping them down there, I was like, oh, I got kind of worried. I thought we were pretty stuck and that we'd have to end up donating the goods locally. But I didn't want to, I mean, I know that while they were, if they have, were to have gone somewhere locally, they would have been appreciated. But I was intent on seeing my project through. I wanted to get them to Houston. Um, so my dad and I ended up renting out a U-Haul and we packed up the 10 foot U-Haul and it was so full that we couldn't, we could barely close the door. Um, and we drove it all the way down to Houston ourselves. It took two days, and on the third day when we got there, we un unloaded the goods at a, um, at a church that we were able to get in contact with, with a um, person that my dad knew in Houston. And it was very successful, and um, now we're sort of still in the fundraising process. And none of it would have been possible without CCSR backing me up and without their help and Mr. Trotter and Mr. Squirk helping me out. And your father. And my, yes, <laughs> and my dad, very I certainly. I you <laughs> that's, so yeah. that, that's, that's fabulous, that's absolutely fabulous. And hearing stories and everyone could do it. If you don't have to, you know, you made yourself special by doing that and you also represented the, the students in your school doing that. And, Talk about a great way of opening up your heart and, uh, you know, and opening up your mind that for the sake of, you know, for anybody, it could have been us. It could be us. So if you treat someone like that, it's always going to be successful for you. And lucky enough, you know, you have parents, you have your father who decided that he was going to take this quality, quality drive with his daughter for three days and then another three days. So that's, that's just wonderful. So anybody else on our committee would like to say thank you? Kathy? Yep. I just want to say thank you very much. And I, I saw the story shared on Facebook and I couldn't believe it. And now you're here. I'm just, it's so, it's, um, it's so wonderful. Thank you so much for doing that. It's incredible. I really wasn't expecting it to be as, become as big as it was, um, but it's all pretty exciting. Um, it was my pleasure. I had a lot of fun doing it and a lot of fun helping. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Of course. Madam Secretary? Yes. One of the information to, through you. Where can residents, if they so wish, send contributions to? Um, so I have, I have a little blog that I made. Um, kind of talking about the trip and on we decided not to go with an online donation system so if people were wanted to donate they um, should do so through checks and one of the posts that I made on the blog is about how to donate and so you write out the check um, you indicate that it's going to Medford CCSR for the Houston relief and then you send it to the high school with the um, attention to Mr. Trotta so you can assure that it gets there. Great. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I'd like to pass it on to Luisa Barbosa and Rubia Fernandez. Okay. Hi, I'm Luis Barbosa. And I'm Rubia Fernandez. Uh, between both of us, we work together on two different projects. Yes, the ELL program alongside Jenna Agno and at Medford's Diversity Day alongside our another partner, Sarah Pinocchi. Um With Medford's Diversity Day, uh, we work with the mayor's office and as well um, with uh, the Human Rights Commission. Uh, what we plan to do with uh, Medford's Diversity Day is to really showcase the diversity um, of Medford because we feel like it is not shown as often. And uh, not just with race, we want to show the inclusion as well with disabilities and um, sexualities as well. And with our ELL Give Back program, it has been recognized recently uh, nationally by the KIND grant. So we were, t out of nearly 200 contestors, we were the top 10, and we're currently finalists for it. And with it, we work together um, to bridge the gap between new uh, students coming from different countries and the difficulties that they may have doing regular tasks and just getting used to the um, to the art culture and like the envir new environment. Yeah, so with both of our projects, uh, it really goes with the mission statement of what CCSR is. Um, so CCSR is really to make global citizens and do it one student at a time. And both of our projects are really near and dear to us. Um, because we obviously come from backgrounds. We were both in the ELL uh, program, I mean. Um, and I mean, we obviously want diversity to be shown throughout Medford and have everyone access to learn more about cultures. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Nice job. When you say that you actually, do you, when students come to the school, do you actually approach them and, and try to like introduce them to other yeah. students? So what it was is that we created a website and it acts as a, an online database with videos. And these videos are made um, in different languages by students themselves. We try and focus on getting students that have been in the OL program because it's a way to get back to a program that helped them. And the videos focus on tasks that we know from experience are very different in other countries, such as opening a locker, getting a bus pass, how to get your money order, or submitting any community service form. And uh, currently we're working on expanding that, so we're um, editing a lot more videos and including more languages throughout the year. Great, that's great. Okay, and are you gonna pass the baton over to anybody else? Yes, yeah. and uh, up next is Kayla Malone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Kim Malone, and um, I'm a senior at the high school. I've been part of CCSR for two years and a half. I originally started helping out some friends of mine who are already part of CS CCSR doing a mural that they were doing for the club itself. Um, and, you know, from the little snippets I heard about the club, I was very interested because it obviously showed a lot of potential. And also, um, the people that were already part of it were already making move like, making progress, uh, two friends of mine also created like a newspaper, so I was like, I wanna like do something for the community. So I joined my senior year and uh, we had to create a project. And what was it for me and my friends? It was a major, like we, there are a lot of issues we're passionate about, but one particular one was essentially that, uh, what is it, the site, well, <laughs> Medford itself doesn't really have a lot of black role models in regards to, um, what is it? like teaching staff in schools, and we wanted to uh, create a way to bring black role models to you know, the young students, and uh, was that we specifically focused on females. So our, our project was uh, Black Female Empowerment Workshops, and uh, our last, well, our first one, our first uh, workshop was last week on Wednesday, the 13th. And um, essentially we brought in speakers, uh, pharmacists and two biomedical engineers who would, uh, ex discuss their lives, the struggles they face getting to where they are, um, and also to give advice to the students that were there. And we had a very nice turnout of 20 to 30 students. And so far we've gotten much positive feedback from both the students and faculty that uh, attended. And um, it would never have been possible without um, CCSR because they pushed 
the club itself pushes and encourages people, like the students involved to find issues that they're passionate about and be able to engage it. And uh, I know definitely that this workshop would not exist if I wasn't, if this club didn't exist. And uh, we have four more workshops planned for the rest of the school year uh, on half days in uh, January, February, March, and May. The workshops that you had, were they videotaped? Yes, uh, by Mr. Eli Opulus over there. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but are they playing? Are they playing on our, like on our studio station? Because that might be something that I think would be very beneficial for all of you, but also to have people see what you're doing, um, you know, the creative workshops. Something like your workshop is definitely something that could be videotaped. Uh, even what the girls have been doing, I think, is something that would be beneficial if you can't do the whole thing, but even a, a piece of it, just to really show off what you're doing. Um, you know, going to Texas and seeing the faces of, of, of what your uh, abilities have done to other people and just to show their faces and, and their gratitude and how they react. You know, and the same thing with the girls, um, you know, having students come in from different countries and knowing that there's this type of, um, you know, a lending hand per se that you're not going to be lost. We're going to be there to help you out. I think it's very beneficial. So if we could play that on, on our station, that would be great. Uh, Ms. Vanderclue? Yeah, so I think tonight we've seen, you know, heard about three different projects which are very different, and I thank you so much for coming forward uh, and telling us about your project and, and girls also about your, your projects. Um, when you look at the project portfolio that the school committee members received, the scope of the projects is really just amazing. And um, it makes me, again, feel so very proud. Because here we have kids coming up with projects, all sorts of different projects. What a wonderful idea to, uh, to have role models come in and speak to our students and for you to um, be interested in that. And then, you know, I read another one, that, uh, one of our students, and I suspect we'll hear from her, um, gladly so, is concerned about the styrofoam that we use for trays. And I could go through each one because there are so many positive, wonderful projects that kids came up with, and not just came up with, but then went forward and said, we're going to do that. We're going to make a difference. And um, I think that you've already made a difference, and I'm so proud that you're making a difference in Medford. So thank you very, very much. And uh, I'm just grateful that the uh, CCSR has uh, flourished and uh, taken off, especially, um, and I know that the leadership has been extraordinarily uh, positive and helpful in this, and so I thank them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just for clarification, Mr. Spoker, you had said that uh, you you're working with the Columbus, the Brooks. What were the other schools? Roberts, McGlynn. And the McGlynn. Okay, so everybody's included. Yep, so all four. Yeah. All right. <coughs> Is there anyone else, Madam Chair? If I oh. could just make just a quick comment. And um, I, I've gotten to meet oh, Justin. I've gotten to meet several of the groups and the passion that you've all shown when you're talking about the, what you've selected to, to bring to the rest of the school year has been amazing. And also the cross grades, so it's not just all seniors working together, I've seen seniors and freshmen and just a whole mix um, that's been, really been refreshing. So I want to thank you all, I know your advisors are fabulous, you have Mr. Skorker, Mr. Tarada, you know, you're great people and you're really invested in our students and it shows because you're so polished and so mature. So I'm just really, really proud of all of you. So thank you for sharing your stories with us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Justin? Yeah, I would also like to add that the CCSR is an organization that truly really makes Bedford unique among other communities. I mean, it really helps to stand out. If you just look at all these projects and the projects that we see in the portfolio, and we know that Bedford students like to give back, they want to give back, and that Medford is in good hands. Um, it's one of the organizations that's central to so much in our community, and we see it in about everything that we do regarding schools and even outside of the community. I mean, I, I remember there was one meeting I was at, and um, there was just a whole list of initiatives starting in Medford, and almost everyone is at the back end of the CCSR. And I would just love to thank Mr. Trada, Mr. Skorker, all the students, all the student leaders for doing so much for our community. Thank you. Okay. I that's it. Hey. Do motion, motion to approve. Else? I think we're all set, right? So can I entertain a motion to accept this? Second. Motion. By Mr. Benedetto, second by Mr. Scary. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All, any opposed? Okay. 
Seven in the affirmative. The report of the C Center for Citizenship and Social Responsibility has been placed on file. Thank you. Thank you very and much. I just want to throw something out there. I know that everybody said thank you to a lot of people, but this is when we talk about networking. And it was the superintendent. Because it was with his networking and going out there and talking to people. And when he hears about an idea that he knows that is going to benefit us, whether we agree or disagree at times, he, the superintendent does bring back so much to our city. And this, this particular program is something that the superintendent definitely worked on. And it was with his networking and finding the people that did it and, you know, showing them there's a reason to come to Medford and there's a reason of why they should uh, um, accept us for their grant. So I just wanted to recognize him for that. So thank you. And now for the report statement of thank you. No, mm -hmm. yep. report on statement thank you. of interest application to MSBA. Mr. Superintendent. So we heard from the Massachusetts School Building Authority and the statement of interest that we put in place uh, last year, last April, uh, is not going forward in this round. Now, I had a good long chat with uh, executives in the uh, MSBA and without going through the whole report, a year ago 26 projects were approved based on available funding. This year only 15 could be approved based on available funding. But we were strongly encouraged to go forward, to resubmit, to push the button, get it back in. And I have a feeling that uh, a year from now uh, we'll, be in the, we'll be in the hunt. Uh, obviously, there's work to be done. We can update a few more things than in the proposal, but uh, I think it's going to go forward, and I think it's just a year, a year delay. Just one of those things happens, and uh, sometimes the, the money coming from the uh, pool is greater or smaller. It just happened to be one of those years. So from 26 to 15 projects, you know, just, uh, it is what it is. Ms. Mustel? Um, it says 83 people of uh, school systems apply in 15. Do we know who the 15 are that? It uh, hasn't been released yet, but uh, when it's released, we'll know. Uh, I was told by the senior staff and their key, key people that the fact they came out and visited us on a full-blown visit with architects and engineers, uh, that we were very close. And then they have a few dates, one date for the accelerated repairs, February 16th. Are you going for that no, one? That's the, we're going for the core program. The, the core program is April. Okay. Uh, the, the accelerated repair, we already got money for boilers for that. Okay. It's really a, a much smaller and more targeted program. This is much more expansive and has longer term value to us. And is there anything you have to do for this application by April that's different than what uh, we've got to come back to you for approval. We're just going to we're look over the bit. application to see if there's any changes we want to make, if there are any things we want to emphasize or modify a little bit. And then we go back to the council and ask them to uh, certify as well. So is it that the other people are more in need that you think mm -hmm. the 15 got it? Yeah, okay. I, I think that, you know, they obviously prioritize by need, but they always pro also prioritize by money. So if you have a project like ours, which could be a very expensive project, uh, they have to be able to fit it in. Okay. Okay. So. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, and. Except for report, place on file. Okay, I just want to actually. Yes. Can I ask the mayor a question? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, um, so you're going to go back to this in April for reapproval, re re or is it going to be starting no, it's from going to you go new back into the pool. A new application. So new application means we have to pay the fee again for? No, there's no fee. No fee, just there's the no approval fee. only, exactly. right? Okay, so I just want to make sure that that's the way that is. But in the meantime, I know that as a committee, we've spoken about certain things that we wanted done, and we were kind of hoping it was going to be incorporated into this. With this not being accepted now, and we don't know when it will be accepted if we go for if we go for it in April, what happens to the projects that we were thinking of doing? Are they just going to get postponed until we find out if we're going to get approved? No. Or are we going to look at it as a committee and start really looking at it and saying, we really need to do some things? There are projects we'll go forward with, you know, and there are projects that we should uh, try to match up with MSBA because they're very expensive projects. Yeah. But there's plenty of projects we can go forward. We'll be going to the council on technology in January and a couple of other things. So we're going to keep moving. It's just a question of, uh, of trying to get somebody else's money to buttress our own resources. Okay. So with a motion from Mr. Scarry, do I have a second? Second. Second by Mayor Burke. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Six affirmative, one absent. Um, the motion to place the report on file is passed. Report on security cameras. Okay, so this is a report you've asked for. Um, the committee has a much more detailed report. Uh, I don't, as a rule, issue anything on security that could lead to someone, you know, perhaps interfering with our operations. So the cover report speaks for itself. The committee, uh, if you want to ask me specific questions at some point, please do. But for the general public, let's just simply say that we've spent approximately $200,000 on security camera upgrades and replacements at our schools. Security cameras, especially external ones, are very fragile devices. Over the years, they have been susceptible to adverse weather conditions, unpredictable power outages. The newer models are a little bit more resilient, but are not invincible and they're not invulnerable. Placement of external calendars, uh, cameras rather, on metal poles outside of the buildings tend to make them susceptible to lightning strikes, so we want to minimize that as much as possible. There are a few cameras. We have no choice but to put them on metal poles because of the angle, but we try to minimize that and reduce that. Uh, we've contracted with American Alarm to upgrade and replace various cameras district-wide. There's 154 cameras uh, across the district in our nine schools, uh, and believe at this time that we have sufficient coverage uh, to ensure security. Obviously, there's some cameras watching different things that aren't as essential as the main cameras that are watching entrances, exits, and main pathways in the school. And, you know, some of those are uh, still have a little bit more work to do, but you can see from the backup report uh, that most of it's being done and will be done very quickly. The maintenance of full security coverage will require that we annually budget significant funding. It's not something that we can just look at every once every five years or four years. It may be prudent to set aside funding and a special account to ensure that it will be used each year for upgrades and replacements, as well as other security equipment that's related to that, like the Raptor equipment and things like that, because those things wear out after a period of time. If, uh, if it's not used in any given year, we can roll it over and, uh, and use it the year that we absolutely need it. Uh, security cameras, I need to emphasize, are only one element of our overall school security and safety response system. We continue to interact with public safety agencies and to practice uh, special situation drills at all of our schools. Um, you have specifics. Uh, I would ask if the committee wants to talk to me about it, you do it you know, personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather not be talking about anything specific um, about security that might lead someone to game the system at all. Okay. Just, just a general question through you to uh, Roy. Roy, since the new schools have been built, has anyone done an audit of the cameras and the way they record the daily happenings? Yes. I know in some instances, you know, the cameras are there, but they don't, you don't get a full view of what's happening. And I, I think cameras that has are two to be types. Cameras are two types. Cameras that move and pan an area, cameras that are fixed on an area. The cameras that move are, are very expensive, but they're also more susceptible to needing more repair and upgrades. Uh, we have upgraded our cameras many times since they were first installed since 2001 and 2003. It's just that the systems changed, they're no longer on DVRs, they're now more digital. Other things are, you know, are, are different than when they originally were installed. Cabling has to be different, they have to be locked into 911 right now. So all these things uh, require upgrades, and they'll continue to require upgrades as we go forward. So we've, we've got good coverage. Some, some cameras cover the same area, but, you know, they cover it from a little different angle. Um, so, as we talk and we set up a meeting, perhaps so we can go into an executive session allowable for security purposes, I'll give you more detail. But I think at this particular point, we're in good shape, and uh, I think we're, we move forward. I appreciate the fact that the mayor has uh, authorized us to uh, spend uh, for the security cameras because this is a big expense. I also want to thank Christine because uh, Christine did an awful lot of work putting it together with Alan Arena uh, in my office to uh, ensure that we did all the work that needed to be done. Mr. Benedetto. Thank you. Um, uh, through you to the superintendent. So thank you so much for addressing concerns on the security cameras and making sure that all upgrades will be done by mid-January um, in, in every single area. Um, I appreciate that as a committee member. Um, 
I just want to talk a little bit about uh, locking of the doors, especially at our high school building. Could you? I know we made some changes in rules. Could you just go over what that is or provide us with an update on that? Let me provide you with an update rather than try to talk about it. It's a big discussion right. about doors because when, even though we lock doors, okay, and we have buzzer systems and the like, somebody from the inside could let somebody in. You know, and we've got to make sure that people know that that's not allowed. And could you look at how the weekends are handled um, at different buildings and like with people using our facilities and yeah. how they're locked after? So I, I'm requesting, I'm actually um, requesting motion, I'm making a motion, sorry, brain freeze, um, to have that report presented to us by mid-January. Um, I'd like to set up, if I could, a special meeting for this purpose because I don't want to talk about security in public. I think that's great. I, I just think, think we start talking idea. about security, we start yeah. opening up yeah. what is and what isn't. It's right. not to our I, I think that's a great idea. Okay. Um, so I'll make that motion that we have a meeting, a committee meeting. Committee, whole. A committee of the whole Second. on, on security and doors locked and just go over different back. things. Um, I, I think it's so imperative in this day and age. And thank you for all the work that you've done to make sure that, that we're moving forward in this direction. Okay, so could I entertain the motion of uh, having a meeting of the whole set up for middle of January? Why don't we on make it uh, as soon as possible? It could be the beginning of February. Because, okay. you know, we, we want to get the work done and we want to get a lot of other things in place so we can be complete in our discussion with you. Okay, okay so motion is to have a committee of the whole meeting for our security cameras to discuss our security cameras as soon as possible. Uh, made by Mr. Benedetto, seconded by Mr. Scarry. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion passes and we will have Motion a meeting. Motion to receive and place this report on file? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Recommendation to approve school lunch charge, I mean, sorry, charge policy. So we're going to call upon our Director of Finance and Administration to talk to you about this. Uh, it's a requirement of uh, the federal government. Yes. Just for clarification, change policy or charge policy? Charge. Okay. Charging of a meal oh, okay. through the um, school, school lunch account. Thank you. Breakfast or lunch, I should elaborate. So yes, we are um, going to be under our review from uh, DESE, the Department of Education, in February of 2018. This is a reoccurring audit um, event that happens every three years now, and uh, we will be up for review. As we started to prepare our initial um, documentation, we realized that we do not have uh, an up-to-date charge policy, which every district is required to have. So we wanted to bring forward uh, a draft copy for review and um, approval in, in regards to when students are going through the line and do not have uh, money for lunch or breakfast that day and or have not qualified or submitted a, a pre or reduced application. So they are, would be of a, a paying status and or a reduced status that still requires money to come through the line for purchase. Uh, again, we have online capabilities so that parents and families can uh, load the funds automatically on a routine basis, get reminders when the accounts are low. Uh, we, so we have to ensure that we have our, our compliance and that the uh, requirements are directed for implementing and enforcing throughout the school year. So the purpose of this is, is uh, mostly informative to in, in, encourage and have the families understand that the meal programs are uh, necessary um, to maintain a positive balance within each of their students' accounts. Um, so we have s charges throughout the district that range from five cents to fifty-five dollars. So in order to be able to pursue them in a, in an accurate way, we need to have our own charge policy identified. So the school lunch program again is required to be self-sufficient. Uh, it cannot go in the deficit, and it cannot pay for its own overcharges. <coughs> so we need to have something in place uh, um, documented. So as, as a whole, as a district, we have a relatively low negative balance in relation to our size and enrollment for the schools, which is very encouraging. Um, so we don't have a significant issue at this time. 
Um, so we, we have a, a district-wide negative balance of about $2,500, um, and that's, as I mentioned, ranging from $0.05 cents to $55. So again, some of these families will put funds on, but we need to have a mechanism to be able to remind them to be able to put prompts and have uh, additional resources to reach out. So the recommendation that we are providing and um, the draft language incorporates uh, the mandatory requirements that we need for this type of a charge policy that follow USDA guidelines as well as uh, school nutrition uh, guidelines here in Massachusetts. So our recommendation at, at the end of the, the draft policy is to limit the number of chargeable meals. Um, we've, we've identified three meals for the middle and high school students and five meals for the elementary students. Now again, this does not mean that children are going through the line and cannot get a type of meal. They would get an alternate meal, such as a cheese sandwich and other items. What it does is it requires that we uh, put prompts in place to notify families, again, via email response through the online NutriKid system and or notes home and or reaching out through the guidance um, departments if there could be uh, some situations at home. So again, reminder to families that at any point during the school year, they can apply for free and reduced lunch. They, if they are getting services from other entities through the Commonwealth, they would be eligible for free lunch and or reduced capacity. So encouraging that um, level of participation, if it's not directly uh, free and reduced application, that they are gaining services in other departments that we would then be able to reach those students. So the uh, document um, in front of you is, is a, in draft form and we would like to be able to have something in place uh, when we have our review coming up in February. Okay, Ms. So I just, a clarification. Um, on, the, on the front page you say we'll cap the charges at three meals for middle and high school students and five for elementary. But then if I understand it, they can still take a regular meal. It's an alternative meal. So if the meal of the day was chicken nuggets and uh, something else. They would be an alternate meal option that would not be um, the same type of meal. So such as a cheese sandwich and, and or uh, another alternate. So we don't, we don't like to have the students come through and, and be in a situation where they've had a meal and now they, they have to return it. So this is where a charge policy comes into place. We are able to prompt them, remind them up front, okay, you've charged two meals, you've charged one meal, you need to remind your, your parents or guardians that you need money in your lunch account. I'm just trying to figure out, first of all, in terms of the alternate lunch, are cheese sandwiches an option for all the time for everybody? They do have an option for, for an alternate during the line, yes. Okay, because one of the things that we worked hard is not to signal students out. No, and it, it's not, a, it's, again, it's not a factor of uh, free or reduced capacity. This is a reminder that their account needs either attention in terms of pre-funding and or a notification to families f to fill out an application that we can get them in that uh, capacity. So three days in a row is pretty short time is what I'm concerned about. And I'm just thinking about for a family who's got a sort of short-term crisis, I mean, uh, there, in, in In regard to the high school and middle school level, so we did look at other districts and some of these their suggested language, and there are many that do not allow any charges at the high school level. Uh, so we tried to be a little bit more flexible and indicate, you know, and again, this isn't, this is sporadic. It's if three days in a row, that's, that's usually, you know, students can be forgetful, parents, you know, might not have been able to, to get online. Again, it's, it's a mechanism to flag either the guidance department and or to reach out to the parents in a more formalized manner to be able to say, you know, we need to provide some assistance and, and con unless it's just a habitual problem with a particular student. Right. So. Well, you know, obviously my concern is for the student who might uh, have not yet signed up for 
uh, reduced price lunch or something, but is all of a sudden there's a uh, crisis, um, and I just wouldn't want them to be in any way signaled out. Um, this is consistent, you say, with other school districts, and we have to have. We have to have a charge policy, yes. Well, I'll be curious, yeah, what other people think about it. Thank you. Um, I have similar concerns to my colleague. Um, <clears throat> you know, this day and age, some families really struggle, and um, paying for school breakfast or lunch is, is not easy for everyone. They, not all who don't qualify for free and reduced have the funds available either. They just might make a little too much money, but not enough for the whole month. And I, I just, I just feel like um, children know that children didn't get the same lunch as them. If they're given the cheese sandwich, the, it, it is a signal. I know we're providing food, and I, I appreciate that we do do that. We do that. Um, it's just a concern for me. Um, I'd like to see the number increase at the bare minimum. I would like to see no number there and just remind us to the parent because I hate holding children accountable for things that are out of their control. You know, sometimes it's not the child, it's the parent's situation that causes the lack of payment. And, you know, having a school lunch person say to you when you're in the line and your friend's next to you, I'm sorry you've already charged two over and someone hears it, it's, it's an issue. It's, it's just an issue for me. So I'm not really on board with it as it's written. And I, again, I wanted to, to go back to the report I requested on December 4th with how many free and reduced lunch applications we received by building, um, by school. Um, you know, are we getting the word out to everybody initially in September? I know it's a great undertaking, so I was just still hoping to get that report um, before we make changes to what we're already doing. So I don't, I don't know. I'm still on the fence. Just a point of clarification: that that's a separate item. This is mandatory for our review. So without this document, that would be a write-up issue. So this is why we're bringing it forward for draft form and um, discussion in order to, if, if that's the, the committee's direction to extend or provide a greater threshold, that's your prerogative at the committee. Just be aware that that could mean additional funds that would have to be addressed and or moved from a different source because the school food service budget could not uh, allocate that. When does this draft have to be accepted by? We are under review in February. Okay, and so as you just clarified, this is something that we have to do because we're, we're being, it's, it's by government? Correct. But the amount isn't? No, again, it's a recommendation. This is a draft document for your review and, and discussion. So, excuse me, Ms. Mustone? Oh, um, the first page, the last paragraph under policy, if students without meal money on a consistent basis will have outreach provided by the administration to investigate the situation more closely and take further action as needed to assist in providing an application for services. So how, like I'm just thinking the process. So a lunch woman, I'm sorry, I don't think there are any men, I'm not being sexist, <laughs> um, sees that there, there's negative balance of 975 for the high school student. Correct. That woman, that dining service will then call no, someone no. for outreach? No, so this, none of this would transpire in, in the course of the line, lunch or breakfast line. Okay. This would be outside of that in the reporting capacity. We would be able to run a negative balance report and identify based on any thresholds that we've established to then reach out. So right now, with nothing in place formally, there's not a mechanism for us to to reach out to those families. Right, but when you're saying outreach, are you saying I'm gonna send them, because I've gotten it, low balance for Nevin at the Robbins, or are you saying Correct. someone will actually yeah. call and say, is something going we would, on? We would call and reach out to the family in that capacity because that would be, they would likely not have an account that they have, they're receiving the negative balance accounts, and or if they have, we would say, it, it, you've been notified, we need to um, address this, or if there's a different type of hardship, let us direct you in the right 
area for services to be provided elsewhere. And will it be your office that will be doing the calling? Or no, food this service? is food service that they have um, access to the reports, and they would run, they run them on a daily basis for their um, number of meals served, act, uh, all of that activity that they could run on a daily basis. May I? I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Van de Kluten, and go. Sure. So I think that the um, having some threshold where. Uh, where the account is followed up on, that's not a problem for me. I, I definitely um, think that all of a sudden the kid goes through the line and they get a different meal is a problem for me. I would rather them still be able to take their re the regular meal, um, you know, at, um, and um, I mean, because it still shows up. I mean, there's, there's still, the follow up would still be necessary, right? Yes, they would be in a negative capacity uh, going through the I mean, line. On it says basis. here, I mean, because there's, there's a punishment instated in here. The child will be allowed to take a meal, and that meal will be continued to be charged to the account at the standard lunch rate based on their meal benefit. So Correct. if the meal is three and a quarter, mm -hmm. even though they're getting a cheese sandwich rather than chicken nuggets, they're being charged the same three and a quarter. To me, there is a punishment there, and I'm not comfortable with that. So, so it is going in, in the school nutrition guidelines. So we're, there's nothing being occurring that is outside of, of that context. So again, if it's the purview of the committee, there would be no, a, a, no item that was altered in that regard. That is what is provided as the USDA alternative and or to encourage participation and or uh, looking for additional services and resources in order to possibly get um, free or reduced capacity. So that's, that's the intent of, and that's the school nutrition program itself. That's not just, that's not a Medford item that, that we're arbitrarily right. so, doing. So I understand that um, it's important for us to have some threshold so that mm -hmm. parents are contacted. And I understand that um, the alternative lunch is, meets the same criteria but I'm not comfortable with that. So, um, Don't substitute. So right. I would, uh, I, uh, I'm comfortable with saying, okay, flag the account, we need to talk to the parents. That's fine, sure. that makes sense. But I'm not comfortable with changing the lunch for the student. Um, mm -hmm. That just doesn't sit well with me. So I think it's important that you understand one fundamental point about all this. When the federal government gives us money to subsidize lunches for free and reduced. If people are getting lunches who are not eligible because they haven't either done the work or haven't, you know, to fill out their work or actually been declared eligible, the federal government looks at that as us taking their money to subsidize people who otherwise should be paying. That's where the federal law comes into play. They're concerned, and by the way, there are communities in the Commonwealth that have run up balances of fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars. In fact, was it Wellesley? Framing, Framingham was Framingham, one. Framingham, Wellesley, places like that really got slammed because people were taking lunches on a regular basis. So we have to have something, but it has to be reasonable so we can be def defended uh, with the feds when they come in and do the do the audit. But the reason behind it is when they give us a free lunch and they pay for it, they're saying then. We want to pay the kid that's eligible. We don't want to pay for somebody who's just never paying. That's the way they look at it. So we've got to find some way to get something on the books. If not tonight, we certainly have to do it <coughs> early in January. And if you want us to come back with some, you know, something a little less, uh, let's say, severe as far as you're looking at it, that's fine. But we've got to do something that's got to be on the books. Okay, Mayor Burke. Oh, Ms. Burke, will you withdraw? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Christine, could you yes. just explain where in the policy the three meals for middle and high school and five for elementary are? Because I'm having trouble. It, it's not. It's not That in was there. a recommendation. So we need, we need to put some sort of a threshold. So I didn't include it in the draft document. I left it so open for discussion. the draft should include? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's, that's the I was intent. struggling to find that. Yeah, it's right. It's not. Me too. So right now, what the policy states is that if you reach zero, you're not allowed to get a la carte items, such as a second entree, or an additional beverage or snack. Correct. So, so again, in that, non a la carte is a cheese sandwich? 
Am I correct? Well, so that would be a meal. So once, once they, if, if they're not paying for their regular meal, the item is, is not, you should not be allowed to charge other items, such as mm -hmm. that make, the, the- Kind of makes sense. The, but you can't get extra stuff. Right. If you can't pay for the core the regular. lunch. I guess that makes right. sense. Correct. But you're defining the core lunch as, is it just a two sandwich? Are there options? No, that, I was giving that as, a, as an example like of an alternate. Thank you. I guess with what Ms. Vanderfeet said, um, if the parents are going to be called anyway, because that is going to be an uh, underbound, right? They're going to be called and said, gee, do you have extra, you have a uh, minus balance on this. Does it really matter if it's like a cheeseburger or if it's a salad? I mean, they're going to be under the under the amount no matter what and they'll be notified so I guess my my suggestion for this and I know that you still want to speak but my suggestion for this is that why don't we look at this and approve what you need to be approved as far as what we need for the federal government so we have that piece but don't approve or like make it separate and don't approve the amount until maybe you could come back with something a little bit better. Well, I, I believe that the, the amount and or the threshold is what really kind of helps drive what the policy and what we're able to act upon at that point. We, we don't have any direction at this point and or to, to reach out in, in a true capacity and say, um, obviously we can, you know, take a look at our current uh, negative balances and, and go from there, but that's just just a, a guideline. So, so we're looking for something formalized in which they will be looking for as well for the review process. So whether it's just identified as a dollar threshold, a number of meals, this was merely a suggestion for that language. If you want to cap it at $50 per child, again, recognizing at the end of the year that has to be made up every year and cannot be funded by the school lunch program. Is there a cost difference between the cheese sandwich meal and the other meal that the school system is like paying more for one than there, the other? There, yes, there is. Is it significant? Like it could be. It's day to day. I, I can't give you an exact amount every day, but if you're serving a cheeseburger versus a peanut butter sandwich, yes, there's a cost differential there. It, it's you know again, it's it's based on you know, federal guidelines and, and what we're required to provide. Okay, my second question is, can we pass this without changing the food we offer to the children? Without substituting the meal? Contacting parents after three missed days, reaching out to do all the out, outsourcing, contacting them to get payment without saying, now you have this separate meal. Can we do it that way? I will have to look and, and get clarification through the SNA if, if that wording specifically is acceptable. That Again, we, have, we do have federal guidelines that we have to adhere to, and this I'd may be derivative that. of that because the federal government is subsidizing these meals through free and reduced programs right. at a much higher rate than the state. So that would have to be um, closer reviewed. So I'm making a motion at this point that you go back and you look at the guidelines to see if we can accept this without changing the actual lunch that the students get. And if so, great. And if not, how, what, how much leeway we have in the number of meals that we need to, to a minimum number that, or the largest number we can the put down. The leeway of number of meals is, is really per the committee's, you know. So we could which, say 20. It, I, I'm saying that that was the, a recommendation based on food service and how we've looked at other communities in that regard. And again, recognizing the cost implication at the end of a, a year, trying to collect on some of those negative balances. So, so we wanted to just put something in relatively conservative as a starting point. Again, this is a draft document to uh, review is a first round and and certainly go from there. So the motions on the floor right Second. now For her to check the wording to see if we can do this and move forward without changing the lunches for any of the students I need a second. I second. Okay, so 
by Mr. Benedetto. The motion is to check the wording to the document and just bringing it back. To see if we can off, that we can um, meet the federal requirements, the with, federal requirements without so. changing the mail options for our students. Okay. And seconded by Ms. Vanderpool. All in favor? We could also, well, if we could also get the actual language that you want inserted into the document, so in policy language terms. Of whatever of a few different options in terms of a threshold for chargeability yes. okay mm -hmm. very good okay so I guess the most the motion is to check the documentation to see what it meets to bring it back to the school committee and also to make sure that we have the actual terminology on the report all those in favor aye. 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 all those opposed the ayes have it motion to uh, place and place this on file for our Great. following week. Just one final reminder to our families that this week Stop and Shop has generously donated free lunch to all the students within the district so uh, on, Thursday. on Thursday the 21st so nobody has to worry about that. And thank you <laughs> okay. out to Stop and Shop. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you to Stop and Shop and if I may uh, superintendent to send out a letter of recognition and thanking them. We Justin, I don't think we did. Did you still want to say something on, on this? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to um, to echo what uh, many members have said about having making sure that we're not discriminating against students because they don't have the financial means to afford lunch in circumstances. And I, I was also concerned with the word that um, she pointed out um, with regard to the, the having two lunches of different policies charged at the same price. Um, I don't think that's equal, and I think that needs review. Thank you. Okay. Uh, negotiations and legal matters, there are none. Two items under suspension. Okay. And two items under suspension, may I have a motion to uh, entertain Motion that? for suspension of the rules. Second. Okay. Motion to suspend the rules by Mayor Burke, seconded by Ms. Vanderpool. So, Dr. Pro is here. I gave you two reports tonight. Uh, one is on the bus situation, the other is on vaping. I don't think we need major discussion tonight, but I want to give you an opportunity to get up to date on this so you're aware of what's going on and uh, we can follow up and give you additional information uh, as we go forward. But Dr. Pro has uh, met with us today and we've met with the bus company, we've met with the police, we've done a whole pile of things and uh, let, him talk, uh, let Dr. Pro uh, explain the reports in front of you. Thank you. Good evening, colleagues. To begin uh, as well uh, for, by thanking and congratulating uh, to outgoing members, Mr. Scary, Ms. Cunha. It's been an honor and pleasure to work with you the past six years. Both of you do the City of Medford dignity and honor in your service. Thank you. Thank you. The two reports that I presented to the superintendent are uh, obviously quite different. One is on, on vaping concerns in the, uh, in the building, as well as some of the some of the maneuvers we have made to adjust regarding the uh, North Medford bus. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions regarding those if you like, or I can, I can present them as well if you like. Brief presentation? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we can begin with the uh, North Medford bus. Um, in response to the incident that took place on Friday, December 15th, uh, we have spent many hours meeting to discuss uh, what took place and why it took place and how do we best ensure that it, nothing like that happens again. In the review of our data, we did notice the North Medford bus has not been filled to capacity over the past few months since we instituted a, uh, a listing and basically um, we confirmed members who, school, students who are attending uh, area, uh, utilizing the bus um, during the afternoon. We have also um, decided to change the location of the drop off and pick up for the North Medford bus. Initially, it had been in the executive loop, which if you know anything about it, logistically is a concern. Uh, there's a lot of traffic during the end of the day in that area. Um, and we do have supervision in that area, but it also encompasses a larger chunk of, of space. So beginning this afternoon, actually, we, we changed the, the bus route to meet in the, the West Courtyard area where the MBTA buses go. This is much um, easier for us to control. Um, because we have a system in place there with the buses and today it went really smoothly. There were 44 members uh, of our student body that took the bus this afternoon without any incident of concern. Um, 
We also uh, will be meeting with the students who uh, signed up for that bus tomorrow afternoon with the police department to discuss concerns regarding behaviors and uh, appropriate approaches uh, when getting on the bus. Uh, for the remainder of the school year, we do have two assistant principals that are assigned in the, in the West Courtyard area for the busing, so we'll be taking attendance and keeping track of students getting on and off the bus. Of course, we have been in communication with the family concerned um, over the past four days, and we are working with them to ensure that they get all the materials for, for furthering their education um, while the student is out. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Benedetto. Thank you, um, Dr. Perella. Thank you for coming forward. Can you just describe what happened? Because we're talking sure. about an incident and most, most people watching at home have no idea what happened, how it happened, and um, just to clarify for ourselves sure. as well as everybody watching. So uh, what took place on Friday afternoon was there were roughly between 30 and 40 students that were in front of the superintendent's offices, uh, and that is usually the pickup area for the North Benford bus, which comes around 2.50. It was a cold afternoon, and as the bus turned the corner to come into the loop, students started to get excited. Uh, my understanding is that they were jostling for position for seats that they wanted to, to sit in, particularly. Um, as the bus came around the corner, it's a very short area where the turn is. Students were pushing. Um, unfortunately, there were two cars parked in that area, which is a fire lane. Um, sometimes we have to continuously ask people to move their cars during the afternoon, again, because of the location uh, where all the administrative offices are. Um, Students, while they were pushing out, uh, one inadvertently was pushed too far out, and as the, car, as the bus was still moving, it, it ran over the student's foot. At that point, uh, the student went back to the lawn. The, the principal, who was right in the area, not too far away, about 50 yards from that, um, walked over. We called the, the school nurse. Uh, the students all got on the bus, then they were taken off the bus. Um, what we did was we were able to get a, another bus to come, quite quickly because we had to have the police department come and the ambulance come as well uh, to, to keep record of what happened and to, and to basically um, investigate the situation. The other students were all uh, got on the bus safely. We be, made a phone call to all the families on the, the, for those students on that bus to just explain to them that it was, there was going to be a late uh, arrival home because of the incident that took place. We worked at the police department as well. Uh, we showed them the videotape that we had of the situation which confirmed the story I just presented to you. So I have a, a few questions. I've been bringing up throughout this, this school year um, some concerns of overcrowding of, of this bus, and I've been assured that it's not overcrowded. Um, and I've been assured that it's been monitored uh, repeatedly throughout there. Is there someone assigned to stand at this bus stop from this point forward? Yes, the, the bus stop has been changed. So it will be in the area where we have uh, more extensive supervision. There has always been an individual placed in that area uh, ironically, because of concerns uh, re regarding vaping that, w that we had spotted in the same exact spot, uh, which is not connected, obviously, to this bus situation. So we have been stretched pretty thin, trying to cover as many areas as we can during the afternoon, which is, you can imagine, is a pretty um, interesting time period with lots of people moving. But for the remainder of the school year and for the foreseeable future, we will have individuals who will uh, monitor the actual getting on of that bus, that specific bus, uh, in the uh, West Courtyard. So uh, another concern I have is, you know, high school kids are big kids and they take up a lot of space on a bus and you add the size of their backpacks, yes. which is like another person, really another small person, um, trying to fit on the bus. And maybe that's why a lot of students are trying to like push on. It is colder now. Maybe some of the athletic teams are done and there might be more students taking this bus. I would love to see it closely monitored and maybe another update in a month as to how that's going sure. and, and that. to, yes. to follow up with this. We don't want our students hurt. Sure. And um, just to, uh, to detail, the, the day of the incident, that bus was not full either. You know, the police department also uh, confirmed that, that there was plenty of space on the bus, unfortunately. Um, and this afternoon as well, there were 44, and the bus fits about 53, I believe. Thank you for the update. You Thank you for taking care of the manor so quickly and effectively and making sure our student was treated well. You're, I appreciate you're very welcome. that.
Okay, Ms. Kratz, she's yes. been pati waiting patiently. Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for the um, updated report, Dr. Barella. Um, I also spoke to a couple of parents, and they mentioned to me that, you know, that over the last week or so, it's been, there's been a lot of pushing and shoving every day. And, you know, I'm just not sure, did you um, interview any of the students to find out why that's happening? Is it because, like, it just seems like it's because it's overcrowded. But I know that particular day it wasn't, and some of the parents I spoke to said that one parent said that their student was waiting in line, but it was so crowded that their student like went off to call for a ride from a parent. So like it seems like maybe it starts out crowded and maybe it doesn't end as crowded, but I think what I've heard is that students are sitting on the ground in the bus. That's what I've heard. And I've also heard that the bus passes aren't being checked for ridership. And, um, and that there's just, for some reason, recently, pushing and shoving going on. So it, it, I don't know why, um, if it's not overcrowded, why are shooting, you know, pushing and shoving to get on the bus? You know, is it? So, so let me answer that a little, because we had an interesting uh, discussion with the police. It seems that preferred seating is the back of the bus. They shove to get to the back of the bus, because that's where they can have a little more mischief perhaps in some cases. And I say that benevolently, but I mean, they want to get to the back of the bus, so they're trying to get preferred seating. Normally you like to sit up close and get off the bus faster, but that's not the case. So obviously we have to have a meeting with the students. We have to make it very, very clear that behavior on this bus is really going to be monitored very closely because you just can't put buses on just simply to you know get more of the same because if they're going to push and shove on an un uncrowded bus, they're going to push and shove in the next uncrowded bus. We've got to make sure that they understand that this is something, it's a privilege to ride the bus. We're trying very hard to give them the transportation they want, but they've got to work with us. Everyone has to own this solution. We also worked with the bus company, Christine worked with the bus company this afternoon, that if in fact we needed a backup bus on a given day because it was particularly cold or we anticipated bad weather. So let's say it was a snowstorm and we know that everyone's going to want to ride the bus we could get a backup bus in that situation, but then it costs us to do that. So we, don't, we want to do these things, we want to have contingency plans in place, but we need the students to cooperate with us. As the headmaster points out, we're going to have a meeting with them. We're going to make it very clear, and if you do things you're not supposed to do, you're not going to ride that bus, we're going to take you off. The other thing that's a, a situation for us is that people like to go with their friends. We can't be in a situation where people who don't need the ride home get on the same bus. It just is not workable for us. There's a major expense with that, especially now we're talking about adding a bus to the elementary schools. We're talking about other kinds of costs. We've had to add a bus to move some ELL students to the Brooks this year. Transportation costs are not inexpensive. It costs $375 a day for a bus times 180 days. That's a lot of money. So if we're going to uh, provide services, we expect people to be respectful and we expect them to work with us. So we've got to keep working at it, no question about it. And the injury is obviously tragic and unfortunate and we've been in contact with the family and we'll continue to be supportive to them. But everyone's got to own the solution. It just can't be, you know, uh, whatever you do will be okay. Set? Yep, I think so. I just wanted to make sure, so are the student IDs going to be monitored to make sure that the students that are going on the bus are the students that are eligible to go on the Fulton Heights bus? Um, I'm not sure, like it does say that there will be administrators out there reviewing student usage of the bus. Are they going to be checking them as they go on? Yes. Okay. Yes, so, so we have a running list as well. As uh, was reported in the fall, there are approximately 90 odd students who could use the North Medford bus, but at any point there's between 30 and 40 that take the North Medford bus, which creates a, a unique situation that, like the superintendent just mentioned, it could happen that in one day all decide that they want to take the bus. Um, but because of the different things that happen at the school with sports and a, a variety of other reasons why they might not be going home immediately after school, it isn't the case on a typical basis. And back to your original questions, uh, my, our understanding was that um, because of the way the cars were situated in that, that day, um, students were sort of getting to the bus by going between two cars, which caused a, a sort of a, a, 
a problem for people behind pushing, and that's, that's basically how it played out. I don't think it's as typical, the pushing part, um, but it is obviously a concern for us, and we'll be addressing with students beginning tomorrow, and that conversation will be ongoing for the remainder of the year. And there was just one other concern was, um, what I also heard was that um, the students were walking like in the street along with the bus. So is there anybody gonna be like right out there making yes. sure that students aren't doing that on, you know, for any of the buses? Right. So that will be happening uh, obviously when the new location is in. The North Method bus is unique because it comes later. It's, uh, it comes by itself. So uh, sometimes it, you know, the time varies between when it actually arrives. So um, sometimes it'll come and students will see it and they'll come running from outside the foyer to get to it. Uh, where the, it's now going to be picking up and dropping off. Uh, there'll be other buses that would basically file in, so it's much more organized in that sense. Um, so we anticipate that not being a, an issue, and, and especially because there's no reason to cross the street where the new buses are coming. That's what the faculty parking area is. But where this area is, is people are constantly crossing, adults and students, to get into the, the uh, student parking lot area. So it, it was just sort of a, a, a concerning location where it had initially been but we think, we think that by moving it, it's going to actually address the, the, the core problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Justin? Yeah, I would, um, I, I would like <coughs> to say that I, I feel that Mr. Belson's analysis of the situation is completely accurate. Um, I, from my experience, students push and shove to get on the bus because they want preferential seating. Um, you know, you don't want to walk onto a bus where half the seats are already taken and you don't have as many options. So, I, I mean, I've been on both sides of the situation where I've been pushed and I, well, I haven't really shoved, but <laughs> I have <laughs> this to show um, So, I mean, I, 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 know, I, I know, I know what it's like to, why my students do this, and, you know, what, what he says is completely correct, and, you know, it's part of our responsibility as students to understand that, you know, this is a privilege and that we have to and using it. And um, I think we, we should find a way to advance that idea in the schools and within the student body. And I'd like to thank Mr. Uh, Dr. Grella for doing that thing. I think moving the uh, location where the bus picks up is very important and it will do a lot of good. You know, I, I just want to say one thing. I want to thank Justin for the first time in my career. Someone said I was, I was completely <laughs> correct. <laughs> First and only. I just want to say. I just want to say thank you to you, the staff, for doing it in such a professional manner, um, and you really did expedite it very quickly. And uh, I just want to say thank you for that because it was it was taken under control very quickly uh, with your staff, with the superintendent, and Justin. Um, I stand here, and sometimes over the years, I kind of think that. You know, what's happening? <laughs> uh, and then I hear someone like you. And you just make it so refreshing. And you really do make me feel that I'm not crazy sometimes, that um, we have to be <laughs> sensible. We're not saying, of course, that this particular situation was the cause of any particular person. Uh, but we have to get back to a society where we have to take our responsibilities, that there are repercussions, and that we have to abide by some rules and we're becoming young adults, and you are going to be leaving the full walls of those high schools, of the high school. So um, it's very refreshing to hear that you understand you can't just be a free-for-all all the time. So thank you. The second topic is uh, vaping and juuling. So um, this is a very concerning topic for, I think, everyone. Um, you know, and uh, I think it's, you're starting to see it infiltrate conversations in homes, and I know I've had that with my children as well. Just to give you a little bit of summary, um, about six months ago we started to see this on the radar that this was this concept of, of vaping or juuling was creeping into schools. And we hadn't really experienced it at the high school last spring. But we had conversations about it. We, we were aware that it was something to be concerned about. Um, in the fall, we began to, to see it more often in the building. Um, we immediately pulled in uh, some experts and had many discussions about it, including uh, the district, uh, assistant district attorneys, um, also the Medford Police Department. We decided pretty quickly that we had to share this information with the faculty of the building. We had um, faculty meetings where we not only discussed it, but we, sh we showed videos of what, how it's used, 
and we also presented um, to the faculty items to look at. In fact, I, I brought one with me today just to show you if you're curious what a vape looks like. And pass it on. And in that uh, case is a classic vape um, with a charger, which will plug into any USB port. Um, and that is actually quite a large one. You know, the, the, the Jules is much smaller. Um, in our experience, it, it's, they're very concerning because they're, they're hard to see, they're hard to find, you can hide them. The, the odor that emits from it, uh, there is some odor, but it's not something that would alert you to a concern. And sometimes it's flowery or perfumey. Um, this is something also that uh, I'm uh, a collaborative with other principals, 10 other principals uh, um, that we meet monthly, and this is the number one topic for all of us, talking about how do we deal with it, how do we uh, react to it. Um, so what, we, what we've what decided at the, at the high school, the building leadership team is, like I said, we've had many conversations about it. The first key was to inform the faculty what to look for and to be aware of this might be happening. Uh, we also um, started to implement the ideas from this into our health courses and health classes, specifically on vaping. Right now, presently, there is a public service announcement um, program, a presentation being created by students, for students on vaping. We think that's a real key ingredient. Uh, but the thing we haven't done really well yet is begin to share this with the community as a whole. And Partially, it's because we were still trying to understand it ourselves, and we didn't feel comfortable basically alarming the community as of something that we didn't really truly understand. Um, to that end, we'll be holding a parent uh, forum Thursday, February 8th at 6.30 p.m., where we have public speakers coming in, uh, doctors and other people in the uh, tobacco prevention field, as well as the Memphis Police Department, to begin the conversation um, with, with the community, as well as um, the In Plain Sight program that was so successful last year about what it looks like, for instance, uh, where it could be hidden and, and uh, what it may smell and, and how do you actually identify this as a concern. So um, obviously we've taken this very seriously uh, and we're gonna continue to take it seriously and we think the best way to approach this is to communicate with not only the faculty and the community and the parents, but really the students to sort of begin the conversation with them. If we're not going to teach them about this issue, without, what are we really doing as, a, as professional educators? This is a concern for us. So these are the steps we have taken to date. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, continue to update you on, on the, the, the strategies that we create and approach for this concern, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Dr. Perilli, you said 6.30 on the uh, Yes, 6.30. This is also run in conjunction with our uh, school nurse, Tony Vento. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of coordination in place for this. Okay. Um, Mrs. Cunha, you question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask really, really quick. What are the repercussions right now if they are getting caught with it? Is it, right. you know, is it based on like a cigarette smoking? Policy? Yeah, so technically it's, it's, it depends on what it is. Um, if it's a tobacco that's being vaped, then of course it would be considered a, like a tobacco or cigarette. Um, there are times when you can, you can vape other types of drugs, typically marijuana, and that would be treated as a drug. Okay, and could you just quickly, for people that don't know what the repercussion is, what is it if it is looked at, if it's looked upon as tobacco, what are the repercussions? So um, basically, the, the key to it is communication with the families. We bring the families in, we talk about uh, tobacco um, as a really an addictive sort of, it's a disease. So we, we do punish, There's a, there are punishments, but, but what we find is more important is the communication yeah. and really trying to help a student move from, if it's tobacco or drug use, to away from that. And we have lots of different programs that we, uh, we incorporate into that treatment or that discipline or that consequence. Okay. It really depends on the situation and the student. Okay. Um, you know, someone who the first time but, uh, is very different than someone that's, that's a chronic situation. But the real key is to bring the families in and to have an open conversation because what we've come to realize is that we can't actually fix this problem. It's a community problem. So the only way we can act to uh, properly address this is in partnership with the, with the families. Okay. And is it the same way, is it addressed the same way if it's marijuana or any other type of drug? It would be the same as if we found them with um, marijuana on them, yes. Okay. And you're definitely right, you have to bring in the family or the guardian or whoever is dealing with that student. Um, but you have programs that go along with that type of repercussion, so yes. it's not just I'm suspending you from no. school for a week and then come back. It's so we moved away from that. Yeah. With chapter two, 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 a few years back, um, in the well, I should say in the in the in the past, yeah, a consequence from something like this would be uh, could be suspension, could be expulsion. Uh, obviously, that doesn't solve the issue or right. the concerns, and, and, and plus, it's at this point not legal. So we have to find ways to continue to educate the student. But we also look at this as an addictive problem, 
uh, and, and sometimes, uh, or oftentimes, the, the solution to something like this isn't, isn't just punishment, it's uh, working with them to find the solutions. Okay. When you have these, when you've been having these types of uh, discussions, is it, I'm just curious in knowing if students are thinking because now it's been legalized that it's not as bad anymore? Is, yep. You know, they just don't think it's anything bad anymore because, oh, well, sure. it's legal? I think there are two pieces to this. One, um, obviously, with the change in marijuana laws, uh, the way it's viewed in society. I think the technology in these are probably appealing for lots of students. Um, and it's also marketed as sort of a solution to people who smoke. So it's seen as a, a cure or a help to cure people, uh, which kind of... Um, I think hit it from, from us is a concerning, like a problem I think in society. So I think there are a combination of factors that probably um, attract students to it. Uh, and also, you know, we hear all kinds of different things and the principals I, I work with tell me that there are uh, games to see if you can actually get away with, with vaping close to somebody because literally, um, if you weren't looking at me and I, I was trying, I was vaping, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't be able to, to smell it. It wouldn't seem like I was doing a, smoking a cigarette or or a drug. So, you know, it's, it's concerning. You know, there's lots of things that, that um, it, can be, it can be done in ways that are hard to find for us. And it's not expensive. So how much is like... Uh, I think that is actually expensive, that piece that? right there. I think it ranges from 60 to $100. Really? The gadget? The gadget, the gadget that we were just right. passing? Yes. yes. Okay. I thought it was a lot. I and a lot of these things can be bought online, which right. doesn't require identification. Okay. So. You know, it, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, I know the schools take the brunt of, of these situations and how to, how to handle them, but we view it as a, a serious community and really a societal issue that we have to work together to, to address. Thank Madam you. Madam Vice Chair, if I could. Mayor Burke. Last year we held in plain sight in City Hall, actually this corner office that's just behind us, and I was amazed at what was in this room and how deceiving these gadgets are. Um, I might have mentioned last month when Team Medford came forward, it could look like a can of hairspray, but really it's not. It's completely empty and it's just a spot for something else to go in. And hair brushes that have pieces that come out. Every object that you may normally see in a bedroom now has another purpose. And um, I really urge all parents to come, if you could announce the yes. night when you have it scheduled. Right. It's so important to be on top of it and have an awareness that this is happening right underneath your nose. And um, to just stay on top of it could make the difference between that road or mm -hmm. staying on track. So it's a great program. And yeah. um, if you need any assistance Thank from, you. from us, please let Thank us you. know. Okay. Kathy, did you have your hand up? <clears throat> yes. Yep. Um, so Dr. Perella, um, over like the weekend um, between Friday and Sunday, um, the Medford High School Medford Vocational Facebook page, um, parents were writing just nonstop about the vaping and um, they want to know um, who's monitoring the hallways and outside the bathrooms and I guess you know like you said it's in plain sight so a student could walk by you and then they're vaping just as they walk by you and I've been told that this is happening. Sure. And that people, are, you know, students are doing, you know, vaping in the bathroom, in the classroom, like Aaron described once before, where they're puffing it right into their sweatshirt, mm -hmm. and it's, they're just, it's, it's done in plain sight, almost like right in the classroom, and yeah. it's, it's really concerning to a lot of parents, <laughs> but it just seems like, like because they're such small devices, very hard to detect, and it's odorless. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mentioned to the parents like that we had the discussion with Team Medford and that Penny was here and I, I added the YouTube video and told them exactly what sections that, you know, were discussed and um, I encouraged them to go to the seminar um, and they'd also like to know when is the student assembly? Um, that was their big question. What did they hear from their children about the student assembly? But I don't think it happened yet or did it happen? No, so um, again, our thinking in the past two or three months is to sort of identify the concern, uh, explore it, investigate it, uh, share it with the faculty and the families, and then begin to uh, working with the health um, curriculum to make sure it's implemented in that, those areas, and then create conversations around it with the PSAs, for instance, that students are creating for students. Um, so I, I agree with 1,000% what you're saying. You know, in fact, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, I was at the principal's meeting in Beverly High School, and as I was leaving Beverly High School, two kids walking in were vaping. As I was leaving the discussion on vaping, and I, and I, I actually did, I turned around and walked back in, and I was like, can you put 
tell them? Like, I, I felt like I was chasing them down the hallway. Mm -hmm. I was like, these yeah. aren't even my students. <laughs> but it, it just really bothered me that this is, this is such an issue and a concern. And I'm sure Justin could probably tell us a lot more than we know. <laughs> I'm sure he will. Um, <laughs> but, but the big concern for us, obviously, is that they're small, they're portable, uh, they can be hidden. Mm, yeah. it, once they go into a bathroom stall, there's nothing that we can do to find out what's going on in there. Uh, you know, as far as we, we, can't, we can't go in the bathrooms and, um, to that degree to check in constantly, looking in and out. We, that happens. We do have uh, the principal go into the bathrooms on occasion a couple times a day to check out the, the bathrooms. But, you know, these are, sometimes it's not done in the bathrooms either. It's, you know, there are a lot of concerns on where it could be done. I do have a question, like, is it, is it a particular bathroom or area, and could we have, like, Officer Riccardi, um, you know, monitor that area? You know, if there's, like, a certain bathroom that's, you know, this is really happening in. You know, I, I also read a comment that, you know, that, you know, one parent said that their child was offered, um, you know, to purchase marijuana at this, you know, outside the bathroom or, you know, in the hallway, you know, so, you know, I just don't know if we need to have maybe Officer Riccardi, like, kind of sure. rotate around. I, I don't know. I, I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Yeah. Well, uh, Officer Riccardi is uh, pretty busy during the day, too, so he does a lot of that, uh, but we can always probably use more supervision and oversight, and uh, I will speak with the principals to uh, really up there, their surveillance of the bathrooms. Um, but we do think ultimately the solution isn't in that it's direction. It's education. in communication and education with families. Uh, we think that's really the way to address it because if not in school, then the minute they leave, you know, I think vaping will continue to be used um, outside, obviously, the school. Superintendent? I think that, you know, Dr. Pearl is expressing extremely well is, is that this is a community thing. Parents, everyone has to be involved. Um, if you put enforcement in one place, they'll go to another place. So just move, move the location. We've got to change the outlook on the dangers about it and why it's not a good idea. And we've got to work with the merchants, perhaps even to possibly put a city ordinance in to ban the sale of it. You know, it may be a, something that we can look at. Uh, and possibly work with neighboring communities to get a regional ban in the area. So it makes it that much more difficult to acquire the materials. This is a comprehensive issue, but it's not going to be done by just having a person chase somebody down the corridor. That's, that's, that may be nice for a particular situation, but not as a solution to the larger picture. The sale is banned to minors, yeah. just like cigarettes, yeah. in, in the city of Medford for, for a board of health. And I'm just, you know, I'm hopeful that maybe it's banned in general, because I don't think it's good for adults either. And if adults have it, they give it to the kids at home, just like a beer, you know, your home. Let's, let's have a beer while watching the football game. Let's, let's do this, let's do that. Sometimes there's a, a sense that if a parent's doing it, it's okay. We've got to get that message across. Justin, I know you had your hand up. Yeah, I think vaping is a really serious issue that really like, came out of nowhere. And um, I mean, it really took hold about like six months ago. And I, I didn't know it was such a big issue until recently, like the beginning of the school year. I think, I, I think we have to work with different communities to talk about it too. Because I know people who've gotten them from Uber or from different cities. And it's just, it's a super serious issue. I think a really effective way we can tackle this, in addition to, you know, implementing lessons about it in the health department and with students, is having faculty, teachers talk about it with students too. My anatomy teacher just uh, wrapped up a unit on drug use of, with our class, and I think it was super super insightful and super effective. And just having having teachers be very genuine about, you know, you shouldn't do this. And actually vaping is, could could be, we don't know enough about it, but it could be worse than cigarettes because, of the, worse, yeah. because of the frequency high that levels people, too. Yeah, the high levels of nicotine and the frequency that people use it. Um, and I, I totally agree, it just has to be a whole community effort. And it's tougher to deal with than cigarettes because it's less, visible, but we have to try. And, you know, we've been so, so successful with cigarettes in the last 20 years. I think we need to start doing the same thing with vaping. And I trust that you and the school committee will do whatever we can. I'm really happy to hear what Justin just said, because one of our initial strategies was to get the teachers to have these conversations with the students in class. We know that the relationships that they build are much more powerful than a presentation in front of 300 students in the auditorium. 
So uh, I'm really happy to hear that because part of the initial training was to inform the faculty what this, these things were and how they operate and the effect that they have on people. Um, so it's good, good to hear. Uh, obviously, we have a lot, a lot more work to do. I think basically point, uh, the point of information on this is really the educational piece, but an educational piece not only for, as you said, the students and faculty, but you know this is definitely something that we all have to have our ears and eyes open uh, about. It's unfortunate because it's not, you know, it's not a Medford issue. This is a, you know, this is a country issue. This is a worldwide issue. Yep. Um, but you know, the bottom line is we're also concerned about our back door and our backyard. Um, so we want to make sure that our kids are safe and I think just opening up and talking more about it and you know as you said Justin we don't have all the statistics yet about this you know like we do about the cigarettes but we don't want to get there either and the more and more I'm having these conversations about this it seems that it's almost like a challenge a challenge that that kids are having just to like if they can get away with it type of thing um, I don't know, I mean, I'm not saying that they don't want to do it, but it just seems like even the example you just gave, that when you were walking by, it's like, okay, could I fool them? Could I get away with it? And I think that has a huge component to it, too. Yeah. Um, but the, the educational piece of just letting them know, you're right, we don't have the, st the statistics yet. Yeah, they made it legal, but it doesn't, you know, this is what really could happen. And um, I, I just think that that's an important piece, but definitely a piece that parents have to be involved in this one. Um, Ms. Yes, I just wanted to thank Dr. Perella for being proactive on this issue. I think it's extremely important. I mean, I remember uh, when uh, vaping was considered to be um, uh, healthier than cigarette smoking, and so the idea was that you were stepping down if you were vaping. And clearly, when you presented the last time and mentioned uh, juuling and the amount of nicotine, um, I was shocked, and uh, clearly um, this has taken on a, a new uh, concern for us. So thank you very much. You're welcome. So I had a, I had a couple questions. Um, are we tracking how many students are uh, how many incidents are occurring both on school in school and on the school grounds? So we have yes. data. Yes. Okay. Um, have we gotten any flyers like just we were talking about at our last meeting about bullets about and putting them up through the school like uh, when vape equals you know a whole pack of cigarettes like people don't know that kids don't know that they think that this is better when my doctor i mean my daughter is getting her nurse practitioner and everybody comes in and said oh i quit smoking i'm just so happy i'm only vaping now and she's like no that is not something to be happy about it's actually worse for you in in many ways even without the data they know that and i think that's particularly uh terrible for, for adolescents, obviously. Uh, you know, adults, um, the impact on adults is a bit different than on adolescents. So we, we are right now um, gathering up a lot of steam for our presentations to the faculty, the students, the community, through the PSAs, through um, literature, as well as presentations uh, for the spring. And we talked about the using the vote graphics department yep. to make those um, posters. The sooner the better. Let's get that education started. Got Let's it. just let them talk about, like, hey, did you see that in the poster in the hallway? And then keep moving forward. Um, you know, I would hate I would hate to have a kid do it one more day than necessary. Agreed. Thank you for your presentation, and maybe by the end of the school year, you can follow up with some data and how things, what things have worked, and what which areas we need to improve. I'd be happy to, and obviously, all of you are invited to that. Um, Forum as well. I, already I hope to Thank you. attend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to revert back into the regular meeting? So moved. Moved. Do I have a second? So second. Thank you. Second by uh, Mayor Burke. Go back to the yes, moment. Vice Chair Pugno. Um, at this point, it is our last meeting of the calendar year, and we have two of our members that will be leaving us, and we'd like to pay tribute to them, uh, Mr. Superintendent. So we have a number of presentations here. Um, mm -hmm. We'd like to make to each of them, and uh, then it's our custom to uh, 
give everybody a chance to say something. So uh, we can let everybody can say something and then make the presentations. That's probably a good way to go. Ms. Vandekloot. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So I've been thinking about this for the last couple of weeks and really wondering what to say um, to my esteemed colleagues um, who are leaving us. Um, first, I'm going to turn to Robert Emmett Scurry, who's been sitting next to me for an awfully long time. And we've shared many different instances, but amongst our colleagues from the back, and some of these names won't mean anything to some of you, but some of them will mean a great deal to other. So we sat with Bill Brady, Lena DiGiantomasso, the esteemed Fred Pompeo, Mary Alberti, Carol Sharpton, Fred Lasky, Jack the Bulldog Buckley, Ed Nolan, Ron Vining, Beth Fuller, Sharon Guzik, Bill O'Keefe, the Honorable Mike McGlynn, and now our current colleagues, Erin, Mia, Kathy, Anne Marie, and of course Mayor Burke. I don't know if I got everybody, but I think you did. I think I did. Yes, you did. And and through that, um, we've had a lot of different um, experiences. With Lena, we were climbing on uh, roofs of buildings uh, to check out the roofs. And then we had many, many long evenings uh, with, um, as we prepared for building new schools. And I suspect, Bob, like me, your proudest moments come when you go see your name on those plaques in the new schools, because those were incredible, uh, an incredible period of time. Bob, you and I haven't always gotten along. Um, we don't, we're not always on the same page, but I know and have never doubted that your heart is in the right place. And this position here and your commitment to Medford and to the students of Medford has meant everything to you and that you have given a great deal of time and energy to the city of Medford and the children of Medford and our families. So, colleague. Almost four decades. Almost four decades. Colleague, I'm not quite sure what it's going to be like sitting here without you, and I'm going to miss you, but I know that you will take your time and commitment and energy uh, working on behalf of students in Medford will continue. So thank you very much for thank your you, service. You uh, now, Mrs. Cunho, you've not been here quite as long as Mr. Scurry, but your impact has been huge over the last, is it 12? 12 years. 12 years. And in that time, we also got to see your family grow up. <laughs> And that was pretty cool. So because they were, those boys, they were in elementary school way back when, and now they're in college or beyond. And um, it's really been quite an amazing ride, Anne-Marie, hasn't it? Um, Don't do this. <laughs> I have to. Don't do okay. it. So in that ride, for, one has to say, I mean, through all of the different things, of course, like with Mr. Scurry, the, the building of the new schools was just an amazing project and so many meetings, so many, so many meetings that we spent uh, talking about the bigger picture and then the small picture. And the small picture was the color of the paint, the location of the switches, and then the bigger issues of equity, which was so, so, so important to us. And you were part of that, you were a very big part of that. Um, and it fueled your becoming a school committee member. Um, and, um, and we were all grateful for that. You went on, though, to be um, very active on the state level, first by becoming the head of the division two for the MASC, Massachusetts Association of School Committee, and then working your way up to an incredible year as being president of the MASC and representing Medford. I quite honestly believe that <coughs> sorry, most of my colleagues here don't really realize what you did during the course of that period of time. But um, I was fortunate to sit on the board with Anne Marie and be able to experience um, her leadership and the amount of work and travel that it took over that time. So Anne Marie, maybe luckily my voice is giving out. <laughs> so I just want to thank you 
as a friend and as a colleague, thank you for your time and effort. And I know that you will be continuing to give um, your heart and your love to the city of Medford. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. De Benedetto. Thank you. I have to find my notes. Oh, here they are. <coughs> Farewell to my school committee members and friends, Robert Emmett Scary and Anne Marie Cuneo. First of all, I want to thank you both for your service and your commitment to the students of Medford. They are why we are here, and you've always put what's in their best effort, <coughs> best interests first. Anne Marie, you have worked hard from the first moment you decided to run for school committee. I think I might have been there then. You were there. You were a parent. Yep. <laughs> we were you, all parents. Yep. You have done many things that have benefited this city, this great city. A few I want to mention are how you helped develop the summer camp program. You represented Method very well at the state level, and you made sure our little theater was remodeled so that our students have a professional place to perform and to receive their many awards. You've worked tirelessly to attain what is best for the students and the employees of Method Public Schools. Thank you for all your years. Thank you. Bob, your quiet mannerism and knowledge in history of Medford have always amazed me. Your passion to make sure our Method students have civics in the curriculum has benefited all of Method students. You have always looked out for me on this committee to make sure I follow the rules and ask the questions in a manner that I get the answers I need and to not get myself in too much trouble. You're also, you also know who everyone is and what their job is. That also has been tremendously helpful to me. I will be calling to ask you many questions and I'm sure you'll be sending me message of what I did wrong and how I ask it right the next time. So I am so happy to have had the opportunity to serve with such devoted members for the last six years. In closing, I just want to say how much I will miss you making faces at me across the chambers <laughs> or beside me when I go on about an issue or I ask oh so many questions. And I might miss when you piggyback one of my comments, which happened again tonight, That's right. to make sure that the superintendent understands what I meant. I'm grateful to both of you. I'm grateful to both of you for the things I have learned while working with you and wish you great things as you move forward onward. Okay, just um, Okay, I'll start with Bob. Um, Bob, I want to thank you very much for your years of dedication. Um, I, I see your eyes light up when you go to a classroom. I went to a kindergarten classroom with you, the pilot at the Roberts Elementary, and we had a blast together. Um, Noah absolutely loves you, and he has the same passion for history that you have. Um, I know that I'm going to see you when I stop by my parents' house and we go for a walk with my little nephew you dog Monty and we you know we'll see you around um, around the neighborhood and um, I just want to thank you so much for you know taking time to you know to be a great mentor and you know um, you know when I first started you, you helped me a lot and you know I, I just thank you so much for that it was it was greatly appreciated and um, thank you so much for your years of service you've just been fantastic in the community um, you've just been everywhere and you just know everything and yeah everybody says it um, You'll be missed, but I know I'll see you <laughs> around my parents' house. <laughs> um, Anne Marie, I want to thank you for your years of service. And um, I think Anne Marie was one of the first people when we first when I first started on school committee. She invited me over to her house, and I got to meet her whole family. And she had coffee and snacks, and she was so welcoming. Um, she immediately started telling me, "Okay, well, there's the MESC, and you need to go to um, one of the meetings to you know the." Um, general meeting to find out what the committee does and Mia Aaron and I went to the meeting um, and we learned 
a lot of information. Um, you've been at all the events. Um, you know, I've seen you at all of the sporting events, the band, um, you know, the Italian, um, the Italian club and all that you do for that. And it's just been, you know, a pleasure to work with you and, um, you know, you'll be missed. And, and I know I'm going to see you around town. Um, and I really appreciate everything that you've done to help myself and to, you know, teach me. And um, you've just been a great mentor and friend. And, you know, you both be missed. And I wish you both the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Thanks, Mayor. Ms. Stone. Anne Marie and Bob, I want to thank you for your service to our city for a number of years on both your parts. And I wish you well. And I hope you find excitement or peace or whatever you're looking for in your next stage of your life. So thank you. Have you Thank lived you. in my house? There's no <laughs> <laughs> it's like your house. We'll pray for peace. Yeah. I just want to add to both of you, I've served with you in many capacities over all of our terms, and it's always been an honor and a privilege to work with both of you. You're professionals. You always put the interest of the kids first, and that's what, most, that's what is most important, um, being a school committee member. So I relish everything that you've done, and I respect the both of you. And I wish you the best of luck in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Superintendent. Uh -oh. So having been around a long time, and having seen an awful lot of things, and having interacted with both of you in different ways and at different times, um, I have some perspective. So you know, I'll start with Bob. Okay? <laughs> so you know, Bob, you've been a coach. You've been a teacher. You've been active in the community. You come from a family with tremendous tradition in public service. An uncle who was a mayor of the city. You had a relative who was an uncle, I guess, who was the Speaker of the House, uh, representatives. Uh, you've been on this committee through different periods of time when different activities were going on. You experienced the sting of Proposition Two and a Half. You know what it's like to be a teacher who got displaced, so you had always empathy for teachers. And you work for the city, the state auditor, and you had a really good investigative mind. So when you play Columbo and Mickey the Dunce, we know that you really know what's going on, <laughs> even though you don't let on that you really know what's going on. And sometimes, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting to see how you play that out. But anyone who knows Bob Scary knows that Bobby really cares about kids. He does a lot of things that he doesn't take credit for, just quiet on the side, takes care of a kid here, takes care of a family there, and just doesn't talk about it. But I know about it because I hear about it. And I think that that really reflects on your good heart and you're really you're caring. And even though sometimes, you know, it looks like you've got that bravado coming on, you're really a uh, soft puppy and you really care about people and you're really one of these guys that you can always count on for loyalty and knowing what's going on without making a big deal out of it. Uh, you were the secretary for the committee for many years. You went over all the bills. Very little got by you, if anything got by you. Um, you know, when you sometimes give me a wink and say, what is this? And I try to dance a little bit and you give me a wink. And you say, don't do it again. You know, and I, I, I remember all those things. So there, there's a lot of history, Bob. We go back a long way and I look forward to seeing you around the community and interacting with you because I know that while you're not sitting as a member, you'll still be an active citizen and an active contributor to the young people of this community. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about, pal. So Anne Marie, you, you are a person that, you know, uh, I've come to know very, very well. You've been very active. You were involved with, you know, the student sports. You were involved with student activities. Uh, very little went on that Anne Marie didn't get involved in school councils, you were one of the great joiners of all time. If there was something to belong to, Anne Marie was one of the members uh, who was joining on to that activity. Uh, you rose up through the ranks, you came, came involved in the state association, and rising to the rank of president of MASC, which gave you incredible perspective, and you brought back a lot of very good ideas, and brought back an awful lot of very, very good thoughts uh, to help the school system move forward. Uh, you've been a good friend can always count on you to you know, listen and to understand some of the perspectives we may have, even if you couldn't vote on a particular issue the way I wanted. But still, you understood it and you, you provided good feedback. Um, 
you're an individual that I will clearly miss along with Bob, you know what I mean, as I feel like you've, you've really contributed and I believe that uh, your involvement at the state level will continue to be uh, an important factor as we go forward in public education. I want to thank you both because it's been a great ride with both of you. Um, as I reflect on all the things that I've come to see, I know that the two of you are among the best school committee members that I've served with, so I want to thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Call Anne Marie up. Congratulations. The Medford Public Schools is proud to recognize Anne Marie Cuno on your many years of service to the children and families of Medford as a member of the Medford School Committee, signed by all of the members. We wish you the very best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll miss you. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to all of you. I was going to write something, and then there's just not enough time for all of it. Um, this was a decision I made, and it is time for new ears, new eyes, but very important to keep the old ones, too. Um, everybody comes from a different perspective. Uh, the one thing that when I started, um, I started with, I was the new member, and within the next term, I became a senior member. Uh, a lot of friends that year called and said, I think I'm going to run for school committee. And they were lucky enough to get on board. One thing that I really urge this committee to do is keep the private and personal agendas outside that door. And keep what's important in here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I said I was going to do this. So, with that being said, always make the decisions of what the kids need and not about what you want done to someone else. It's very important that um, it's about the kids, it's about the budget, it's about knowing what your positions on this committee are. Um, don't want to be disrespectful to any PTOs. I've been there, I've been on the site councils. This is not a glorified PTO. We have to abide by rules, regulations, the state, and federal government. And sometimes things seem very easy, but they're not. So with that being said, I just want to say thank you to all of you, to the superintendent who always has his door open. This was my decision to come Oh, Thank God I didn't get it now. It wasn't because I, I didn't want to be here. Um, he opened up the door into the administrators, Diane Caldwell, Beverly Nelson, um, the principals that I have worked with, uh, you know, the mayor's office, past and present, um, Dr. Perella, all, all, really all of, the, all of the principals have always had an open, uh, you know, open door. Um, when I can't track the superintendent down, I track him down because I will run to his office. And I think there were days that he probably said, oh my God, another idea. What is she going to come up with today? But all in all, it was just a wonderful ride. Um, and I couldn't have done it <laughs> without the people back there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, when I decided to run, it was a family decision. My family has been there through and through, except for the boys tonight probably were saying to themselves, I wish I was still in school for the next couple of days because they just got home from college. Uh, and Michelle's probably thinking, I wish I had one more final tonight so I don't have to sit here. <laughs> but other than that, to my husband, to my son Michael who came, and to everyone really who has always been there for me uh, to make me look good back here. But just work with your minds, but really work with your heart. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, there's no, oh, I have plenty of life, believe me. This was the relaxing part. <laughs> Congratulations. The Thanks, Metro Public to be back. Schools is proud to recognize Robert Emmett Scary Jr. on your many years of service to the children and families of Medford as a member of the Metric School Committee. Right, we wish you. you the best of luck. This, little, this man made a buddy bench for the Brooks School. Abs absolutely beautiful piece of furniture. And I know you always Nobody's have the kids. To know about that. Always have the kids at heart, yes. but you know what? It's important. You do really nice things behind the scenes, and we appreciate it. So. If anybody needs a picnic table, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Please, say a few words. Sure. It's been a long, 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 fun term being a school committee member here in Medford. Uh, Roy, I'm not going to let you sneak out unscathed tonight. <laughs> uh, you know, you've done a lot of great things for Medford, but the only thing that I really disagree with you with was when you tried to take my soccer field and baseball diamond away. At one point, remember when he wanted to build a school to place that park? <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the main reasons I ran for the school committee was I wanted to see the schools change. They've done a complete 180. We have beautiful buildings, and I just hope that you guys will keep up and give them the maintenance that they need. It was long overdue in a city this size. Uh, I've had a lot of friends along the way. I've had the dubious distinction of working with Bev Nelson. She was my mentor when I taught at the Roberts. I taught at the high school. I taught at the vocational school. And uh, like Roy said, Prop 2.5 came by. I gave up my coaching job. And uh, I rediscovered myself as an investigator. But I never lost my feelings for education. And that's why I'm here. Uh, at one point, one of the members of the Fourth Estate uh, gave me the wonderful pen name of the laconic one. I found that it's a lot easier to work behind the scenes, make your opinions known, do your homework, do your research, and get things done that had to be done. A few years back, we needed kindergarten aides, and it was out there. It was an issue that had to be content and dealt with. Budget time came. Nobody said anything. At the 11th hour, I spoke up. and. Uh, we got our kindergarten age, thanks to Mr. Belsa. It was something that uh, the kids deserve. And uh, the thing that I've always been proud of, that I've always fought for the underdog. I've always made sure that kids at the high school that were having problems passing their MCAS test, that we provided the instruction and the tools that they needed to compete in a global economy, finish their education, and move on. But once again, I'd like to thank my family, my friends, the res residents of Medford for their understanding and the trust that they placed in me with their children for the better part of the last four decades. And I'm looking forward to getting down to Myrtle Beach, doing some golfing, and uh, reassessing where we go from there. But uh, I make this place to you and to the audience at home. I will continue to be your voice for public education here in Medford. And uh, God bless everyone. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy New Year, and uh, we'll be back. Thank you. So, because it's so late. Yeah. Uh, just one last announcement to the general public. Uh, we will be having our inaugural festivities. New Year's Eve morning, so it's Sunday the 31st at 10 in the morning at Medford High School in the Little Theater, followed by a light brunch, light collation at Bistro 49 to showcase Medford High School, its students, its musicians, and uh, just the wonderful things that are happening up there. So please feel free to join us. This is your official invitation, so come, come on down uh, on December 31st. Otherwise, have a wonderful holiday. We will resume back in the new year. So everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and enjoy the, the short break that's coming upon you. Okay. Motion, Motion adjourn. to adjourn. Seconded by Mr. Scary. All those in favor.